Hello, everyone. This is Michael Gibbs with Go Cloud Architects. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the founder and CEO of Go Cloud Architects, and we're an organization dedicated towards building high performance cloud computing careers. I've been working in tech now for over 25 years. Well, it feels like a long time. And I've been helping others find their first tech job or get promoted in tech for well over two decades now. And I have loved every last minute of it. Today, we're going to be doing part two of our AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate course. So this is a free, full AWS course. And the reason we're doing this is we want to make sure you have the opportunity to get cloud hired. So we're going to give you the best certification training experience we possibly can. We're going to run this like a real training camp. This is not a just watch some videos and hope you learn kind of experience. I want this to be a wonderful live interactive experience for you as if you went and purchased a real quality training program where you can ask questions. So the way we're going to do this is as follows. We're going to do 40 minutes of lecture slash labs per hour with 20 minutes of questions because I need to know that you really know and you're really learning. I want you to have the best experience ever. But before we begin, I want to tell you about some really cool and fun things that we're doing for you. Tomorrow, we have our completely free how to get your first cloud architect job webinar at 9 a.m. Eastern, which is 2 p.m. UK time. I strongly, strongly recommend you're there. Um, the, Chris from my team will pop a link in the description box over here in the chat box um, to let you know about that. On Friday this week, another fun event. I'm bringing some fantastic recruiters from IT Excel, one of the best IT recruiting firms I've ever worked with in terms of 20 years um, when they're basically placing my students. They have placed more people than I can count over the years, and they are exceptional. And they're going to be here on Friday to answer your questions to get you get help you get cloud hired. So everything we do is about cloud hired. We do do certification materials. That is not our business. We are not in the certifying business. We're in the getting people hired business. And certification is maybe 10% of the process. The other 90% is where we specialize in. But we want you to have an amazing cloud computing experience. If you want to be a solution architect, if you want to be a cloud architect, cloud solutions architect, enterprise architect, we want to help get you there. And part of that has to be going with the fundamentals of how these systems work. So today, we're going to make sure that you have a great time. Now, if you can hit the like button, if you enjoy our concept, that's extremely helpful to our organization. It's great for the algorithms. Likes, comments, and shares. So please, if you're enjoying this content, please leave a like. If you know anybody that would benefit from this content, please share this experience with them so they can join us. But I absolutely love this. I see Tyrone there. I know he's in South Africa. I saw some other South Africans. I'm seeing some somebody from England that just said they're here. This is really great. Las Vegas, I'm seeing, you know, Nigeria. I'm seeing, you know, how wonderful is it that we can get so many people from so far away. So in case you weren't here yesterday, you know me, I'm Michael Gibbs, and I'm the CEO of Go Cloud Architects. I have Alonzo Coleman with me. Alonzo is a fantastic cloud architect, someone that I consider to be a very good friend, someone that's agreed to spend his time, and he'll teach you how to build some of these things. Now, understand that we're architects, and we architects don't configure, we design. But you know, Alonzo's also got some great cloud engineering skills, and he feels this mission is very important of spreading the word of free certification training because he, like me, feels like you need more than just the name of the service and how to configure it. He and I want you to have the best experience so you can become cloud architects and have great careers. So I will be presenting, Alonzo will be demonstrating, and we're going to try and make this the best AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate experience you can have. This is our AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate 2020 course because they, the test has changed recently. There's some configuration things in there, and we're there. Um, hello, Gabin, Gabena. I, I, your name disappeared, so if I didn't get your name completely, I couldn't read it all the way. Good Welcome. Day. So happy to have you here. So let's recap what we did yesterday. And if you haven't seen yesterday's class, um, you can go do it. But yesterday, in our the first day of the AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate 2022 course that we did, um, here's what we did. We covered, you know, what is the cloud? We also covered the organization and layout of the cloud. We covered object storage so far. Um, and we talked about direct connections, VPNs, and the networking trade-offs and performance associated with it such. So today, now it's fun time. Now we're going to go back to um, storage. 
So I'm going to begin with instant storage. So if you'll recall, yesterday we talked about object storage specifically. And the object storage that we spoke about specifically was actually AWS S3 or the AWS brand of uh, instant, the AWS brand of cloud storage. So, you know, now you, you know what we're kind of talking about here. So let's go talk about, you know, instant storage. So when you set up a computing instance or a virtual machine on the cloud, it has storage associated with it. Now the storage that's actually associated with your virtual machine is actually coming from the storage sitting on the physical hard drives of your computers. And when you're dealing with AWS, most of their big servers, they typically have a bunch of eight terabyte NVMe drives in a RAID configuration. So the instant storage is really fast. I mean, really fast. I mean, these servers, realistically speaking, you can get you know 15,000 megabit per second throughput through them like nothing. You can, uh, you can basically get yourself you know 5 million IOPS like nothing. So the instant storage or the storage that's inside of these physical servers is fast. 5, 10, 15, 20, 100 times faster than the fastest EBS block storage volume you can get. But instant storage has a problem. What is instant storage? It's the storage that's locally attached to the virtual machine. Here's the problem. If you shut off the computer, all your information goes away. It's ephemeral. So imagine having a hard drive in a server. You pop it in, you reboot the server for a pattern upgrade, and you have no hard drive versus storage. Well, that's what instant storage is. So obviously we can't use it for much of anything because it doesn't persist. So let's look a little bit about what it's like when you've got basically a virtual machine in the cloud. The virtual machine, you set it up, it's got an associated hard drive with it, and there you go. But it gets deleted upon reboot. So instant storage, high performance storage, but deleted upon reboot. So it is definitely not someplace where you're going to store your computer, your server. So think about it this way. If you need storage and you want it to persist after a reboot, which everybody does, you can't use instant storage. So just keep track of that. So if you're using instant storage for boot, make sure you've got an EBS volume or block storage that's going to store your data that you don't want to go away. Now let's talk about the next type of storage. If you recall, yesterday we talked about object storage, which is a storage area network technology type. And today we're going to talk about block storage. And guess what? Block storage is another type of storage area network. And block storage is a little different. The data is taken and broken down into blocks. And we covered this yesterday, but I just wanted a refresher. So the blocks are, remember, block storage is network storage. So the performance limitation of block storage is actually the speed of your network. So the fastest EBS volumes you can actually get are still only a thousand megabit a second. I want you to think about that. Traditional hard drive, about 150 megabit a second. SSD drive, about 560 megabits per second. NVMe drive, generation four. Um, Non-volatile hard drives, you know what we're talking about in terms of speed? We're talking about 6,000 megabit a second. So, you know, $100 drive at Best Buy is six times faster than the fastest EBS volumes. Why? Well, network storage is much slower than local storage. And to get to that level of speed, even with a 100 gigabit network, um, network interface, you could basically get to what you could do with a good NVMe drive, maybe 30, 40% faster or so. To really get speed over a network, you'd need 100 gig networking or multiple, multiple, multiple 10 links, gig links bundled together. So now when you're dealing with block storage in Amazon, they have their own branded version of block storage. One of the ways you can decipher the Amazon brand from things is they stick the word elastic everywhere. It's their brand, they brand around it. So block storage on AWS is called elastic block storage. Why are organizations using it? Because it can look and feel like a regular hard drive to the computer. Remember, block storage is network storage, which means it can be anywhere on your systems, which is really cool. But because it can be anywhere, and remember, block storage lets you put your storage environment somewhere and your compute environment somewhere else, so it's real efficient. So block storage is used everywhere. 
Block storage is used like a hard drive. So basically you set up your compute instance, which is a virtual machine and we'll cover them soon. You have to add storage. So you mount a hard drive. The hard drive that you mount is block storage, a virtual hard drive and network-based hard drive, and then it works great. So now you know about what is block storage. So where are you gonna use block storage in AWS? You're use, gonna use it on all your virtual machines. You're gonna use it to store your databases. Block storage is very scalable. And again, it's not deleted upon instant termination. Now, this is high availability storage designed for mission critical use. You recall when we talked about S3 and I said the storage was 99.99% available and I said, well, that's not super high availability because you know, you're gonna have an hour of time that it's not feasible per year. Now here, this is different. We're getting 99.999% available. You know what this means? Your storage will be there for you almost all of the time with up to only five minutes and 25 seconds of, or five minutes and 15 seconds of downtime per year. So it's gonna be there when you need it. This is good storage. This is high availability storage. This is what you're looking for. So let's talk about what else. Theoretically, this is high throughput. Theoretically, this is designed for high transaction workloads. Point is you can kind of get basically the performance that you need now, when you have block storage, it's gonna be typically associated with a single availability zone, meaning a data center, but it's gonna automatically be backed up to another data center or another availability zone. And that's kind of good news. So let's look at the way EBS volumes are backed up. Because the way EBS volumes or block storage volumes are backed up in AWS is really, really interesting. What's so cool about it? Typically speaking, you've got a hard drive and you run some backup software and you back up the files, which works great. But let's take this up one step. When you back up an EBS volume, you back up everything. You're making an exact, exact, exact replica image of your drive. So think about it this way. Because you're making an exact replica, your backup goes down you can just take that back up and instantly launch a new virtual machine and it will have everything identical as the old one. Same boot, same everything. The only thing that's gonna change is the IP address because it's a new, new virtual machine. And if the IP address changes, the DNS name will change, but otherwise it'll be an identical copy. So when you're creating a snapshot, it's basically creating an exact, exact replica of your data. And that's what it's doing. So let's talk about EBS volume types because there's a few of them and, and why. So you're gonna have to choose the right type of block storage. And when you're choosing block storage volumes, you typically have to think about performance. And we can discuss performance in terms of throughput and latency, and they're not the same. Latency is how long it takes to access the disk and write to the disk, that's latency. Three put is how much stuff you can move. So I'd like you to think about it this way. Latency is how, pretend you're in a car and you wanted a fast car. Latency is how fast you can go from zero to 60. So you get in a Lamborghini or a Ferrari, you put your foot down and it, there's not a lot of latency on that car. Poof, you're at 60 miles an hour fast. Now, here's the throughput of that 60 mile an hour car. How much could you put in the trunk or the boot or the back seat of that fast race car? That's all the throughput you can do, the amount of stuff you can move. Now let's take a big giant truck, a big giant tractor trailer. From zero to 60, not super fast, but look at what can be carried on a tractor trailer. An incredible amount of content, an incredible amount of stuff. So throughput is the amount of stuff you can take with you. So when we're talking about drive performance, we're talking about two things. Latency, or how fast it takes to input output operations to the computer and to the drive, or throughput is how much stuff you can move at the same time. So if you're dealing with large video, video files, meaning we were to record large video files that are terabytes big, and we wanted to send them, we need high throughput. If it's not real time. Now, if you're accessing a database, you know, 50,000, 100,000, 500,000 times a second, we need low latency. So it's just knowing that you have the right storage type, the right performance type for your business requirements. So let's go through the, 
the, the types of IOM. We're going to start with your EBS provisioned IOPS, and there's a couple of flavors of those. Now, realistically speaking, this is the best performance option you're going to get on AWS. It's SSD storage. It's relatively low latency because it's got moderate to high IOPS or input output operations per second. It's great for databases. Realistically speaking, it's good for apps that require low latency. And you know what? You've got moderately good throughput with these things too. A thousand megabit a second, which is pretty much the limitation of the 10 gigabit ethernet link that you would have on most servers. So relatively good performance. Again, nothing like you could put on a server in a data center. Because you know here we're dealing with EBS volumes with 64,000 IOPX maximum, or the new fancy font kind that have you know up to 250,000 IOPS maximum. But you could go to Best Buy and you can buy a hard drive for 100 bucks that's got a half a million up. So you compare that in terms of performance. But this scales well. And this is your only option in the cloud for good network disk performance. So kind of try to remember these kind of things so you understand it. Better performance in the data center, but it doesn't scale the way the cloud does. So no, if you need super high disk performance, that might not be in the cloud. Or you're going to have to do RAID or other things, which you know we'll talk about. So just giving you the idea of how to scale your storage needs. Storage is really important. Now, if provision IOPS is the best, the fastest, and what you're going to use for low latency applications, what would be second best for most applications? And this would be EBS general purpose SSD. This is general purpose SSD drives, so they're not NVMe drives. They're great for boot volumes. Why? Fast access because it's SSD, a relatively fast access, low latency because it's SSD, and it's got relatively high IOPS, meaning input output operations per second, but less. Now, the only place where these EBS volumes, these general purpose SSDs, are kind of weak is with regards to throughput and that they only do about 250 megabit a second, which is about half the speed of a normal SSD drive. Having said that, transactional workloads, like a database, could do really well with this. Phenomenal for a dev and test environment. So basically, you might need to use a provision IOPS volume in your production environment for your database, but you might get away with this in your test environment, reducing costs. So fastest, provision IOPS. Next fastest is actually with regards to latency is general purpose SSD. Remember, general purpose SSD does not have good throughput. It's only about 250 megabit per second. Now let's talk about the next kind of storage. This is going to be magnetic storage. Let's say you need a good degree of throughput, like that tractor trailer that's carrying stuff, but you don't need low latency or a lot of operations per second. Let's say yeah, this is like transferring big video files or big images back and forth. This is where you can use an EBS throughput optimized hard drive, which is basically another type of block storage. Here what you have is low cost magnetic storage. So with it, it's going to have low latency, low, I mean, high latency, low IOPS. But the throughput on this is actually relatively decent. These drives, you know, throughput is about 500 megabit a second, which is double the, uh, what do you call it? The throughput of a general purpose SSD. So if you've got a lot of data to transfer and latency doesn't matter, this is really great. The cost is good. Why is the cost good? Because you're dealing with magnetic storage, which is much cheaper. They're obviously using RAID arrays, and that's why the throughput is good. And the latency is there. So don't use it for a database, but do use it for things for which you're transferring a lot of files. Good, good storage. Now, the last type of storage we're going to talk about is as follows. Cold storage. So basically, this is going to be the lowest cost, lowest performance drive that you can get. You can use this as an EBS volume for things that don't require a tremendous amount of use. So for workloads that are not accessed frequently. So I really want to talk about RAID before we go into anything else. But before we do, does anybody have any questions on these EBS volume types? So if, any, if there's any questions that came in on the EBS volume times, great. Otherwise, I will continue to move on. I'll give you guys all approximately 30 seconds or so. If you're having fun, please leave a like or a comment. If you're here and enjoying yourself, I would say let us know by typing Cloud Hired, but it looks like some of you guys did. But please let me know by typing Cloud Hired. And if you've got any kind of questions about this, let me know. Otherwise, I will go straight to the next section where we talk about RAID. I'm so happy we we're able to solve that, Manash, then. 
Nick, what would be a perfect use case for instant storage? In, in the cloud, there's not a lot of good use cases because it all goes away with upon reboot. But so you're probably not going to use it for much of anything. But if you really needed to do something that was just going to be something that would just come up and it wasn't storage where it was just doing compute, compute, it would be kind of, you know, kind of nice. But realistically speaking, I don't use instant storage for anything. The concept of ephemeral storage or storage that goes away with reboot is uh, too scary for me and too risky to use. Um, sure. So the next question is explaining storages. So direct attached storage is something that's directly connected to the computer. Network attached storage is something that's connected to the IP network. Storage area networks, again, are typically connected to the systems, but storage area networks are typically connected via fiber channels. So when you're dealing with NAS systems, which is network attached storage, which typically uses the iSCSI protocol, versus storage area networks, which could be over IP, but they often could be over fiber channel and the such. You're still dealing with these big giant RAID environments and you're still connecting over a network. So it's really just a network type. But direct attached storage is something that will be plugged directly into a computer. You're not gonna be using, generally speaking, direct attached storage in the cloud. You're gonna be using block storage to pretend that it's direct attached storage, but it's really a storage area network you're actually using. Yes, we're going to do raid raid next, and it's very fun. In the last shot, please explain S3 services of different classes. Yesterday, if you go back to the video, we spent about an hour on this topic, so I'd like you to recommend that. Chris from my team will post a link of that video in the, in the, the chat box so you can see it. We spent an hour on it, and there's lots of great content, and I'd love you to see it. If there's no more questions, we're going to go back to, uh, we're going to discuss RAID. Okay, let's go talk about some RAID. So what is RAID? RAID is one of my favorite things, and I use it everywhere. RAID is basically the, re uh, recall as means redundant array of inexpensive disks. So let's talk about what is RAID? RAID or is basically where you take multiple hard drives and you combine them together to improve speed, redundancy, and performance. Now, when you make a RAID array, whether it's two hard drives or 200, it all looks like a single hard drive to the server. So what happens is, it all looks like one. So I want you to think about this. If you had, for example, a hard drive that's got 500 megabit per second throughput, and you put 10 of them in a RAID array, you can get 5,000 megabit per second throughput if it's a RAID 0 array. So basically what you're doing is you're using multiple drives to increase speed, performance, and redundancy. Now, there's a lot of versions of RAID but realistically speaking, they all fall into one of these categories, RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, and RAID 10. Every business uses some flavor. Now, RAID 50, RAID 60, all that stuff is variations of RAID 5 and a couple other things. So realistically speaking, RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, and RAID 10. Let's talk about RAID 0. RAID 0 is something that, generally speaking, organizations wouldn't use because it's too risky, but RAID 0 gives you incredible performance, and in the cloud, you might be using some flame of RAID 0. RAID 0 is where you take multiple drives, and you put data from one drive to the next, to the next, to the next, all in order. So if you've got your 10 drives, your data is split amongst all 10 drives evenly. Right to drive one, right to drive two, right to drive three, right to drive four, right to drive five, right to drive six, right to drive seven, right to drive eight, right to drive nine, right to drive 10. Start back and do the same thing. So imagine 10 times the speed, if 10 drives, 10 times the capacity, all sounds great, right? Well, it was until we have one problem. Here's the problem. With RAID 0, if we put things on 10 drives and one of the drives fails, guess what you have? Nothing. You lose everything. 
So RAID 0 is typically really dangerous, which is why organizations would never use RAID 0. It's just too dangerous. So architecturally, let's look at RAID 0. What's going on here? I've got two drives and a RAID array. You can see I'm writing to drive one, I'm writing to drive two. Writing, you can see block one is on drive one, block two is on drive two. Block three is on drive one, block four is on drive two. Block five is on drive one, block six is on drive two. Block seven is on drive one, block eight is on drive two. And so on and forth, of course. But it's that single point of failure that makes this dangerous, which is why organizations generally wouldn't use these things. Because it's too risky. Now, that's RAID 0. And generally speaking, here's where RAID 0 used to be used. Let's say you're a video editor that needs extreme throughput. They would run RAID 0, and they would use RAID 0 on the drives that were storing the video volumes that we were working with while they were working with them. As soon as they would get finish the videos and they export the videos, they'd stick it on standard storage. So RAID 0 is typically considered temporary transactional storage in general because it causes basically no durability of your data should anything happen. Basically, no redundancy. So now let's talk about how do we bump up the redundancy the best way or most effectively. This is where RAID 1 or mirroring comes into play. Here's what RAID 1 is. You have a single hard drive, and you have a backup hard drive. You've got a 20 terabyte main drive. You've got a 20 terabyte backup drive. Everything that's written to the top drive is immediately copied to the bottom drive at all time. So basically, you've got synchronization, 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 synchronization. Top drive fails, break the mirror, run off of the bottom drive. Real time, everything is backed up into perfection. OK, what's the downside of all this great stuff with RAID 1? Well. One hard drive needs a backup. So it's got a backup on a one-to-one -one ratio, which is not great. But what else are we talking about? Two drives doesn't improve the capacity. So it's just pure backup. So it is slow. No speed benefits gained from copying things from one drive to the others. It is expensive and the capacity is terrible. So architecturally, let's look at this. What are we seeing over here? See how we have the two drives, hard drive one and hard drive two. Note the block one, block two, block three, block four, equally distributed across them. What are you seeing here? This is exactly, exactly, exactly RAID 1, just mirror. Now, as you can see, RAID 0, high speed but too risky. RAID 1, complete redundancy, no gain in speed, extremely expensive, extremely slow. So now what? So now we're going to talk about what every organization in the world does, but you don't do in the cloud because you still need to know because you're going to be able to, you're going to have to explain this to the storage people. So what every company in the entire world uses, they use something called RAID 5. RAID 5 combines speed, performance, and redundancy. RAID 5 requires a minimum of three drives. And basically what happens, you take your data and you split it amongst your drive, but you'll also include something called parity data. What is parity data? Parity data is recovery data. So if you've got three hard drives, you're going to have the data storage on two out of the three, and the extra backup data will be distributed throughout the extra drives. So you'll have the capacity of all the drives minus one, because that one extra drive is written there for redundancy. So high speed. High redundancy, used by everybody, but you don't use them on the cloud, and here's why. When you run RAID 5 to some degree, it can add a little bit of latency, which in the data center is no big deal. But remember when I talked about block storage volumes being relatively poor performance compared to what you can do in the drive? So if all you can get on an EBS volume, a standard one, is 64,000 IOPS, and you need a million IOPS, you basically have to put 20 of them in a RAID 0 environment just to get that performance, which is a lot and risky. So if you use RAID 5 and you're writing the parity data, it's going to slow it down more. So in the cloud, you don't use RAID 5. It's not because RAID 5 isn't probably your best RAID. It's because the cloud block storage is so poor performance as is, when compared to data center performance, you can't handle the additional overhead. So this is the way... Um, RAID 5 works, you still need to know it because this is what you're going to find with every customer that's moving to the cloud. Note what you can see, look here, look that they wrote to block one on drive one, block 
drive eight, block two on drive two, block three on drive three, and then we had parity data on drive four. Then next time we put data on drive one, drive two, parity information on drive three and four. And then next time we put stored data on the first drive, some parity on the second, and some data on the third and fourth drive. We constantly do this. So if one of these drives fails, here's what we do. Pull the drive out, pop a new drive into the RAID array, ask the RAID array to basically take the parity data and rebuild it, and poof, we're up and running. We got high performance storage again, no loss of data. So I love RAID 5. Internally at Go Cloud Careers, we run RAID 5 for everything. 90% of all organizations run some version of RAID 5. RAID 5, RAID 15, and we can talk about more of what they are, but almost everybody uses it. But you don't use it on the AWS Cloud. Now, the last thing, the RAID, RAID 10, we're going to talk about. This is what you do on the cloud if you need high performance performance, high performance, high disk performance. See, if we can't do RAID 5 for latency, and we can't do RAID 0, even though it gives us the speed and performance that we need, and we can't do RAID 1, because RAID 1 gives us the perfect redundancy, but not performance, what do we use? We use RAID 10. So here's what we're going to do in the cloud. We're going to make a RAID 0 array for our data, and we're going to create a backup RAID 0 array. So two RAID 0 arrays, and then we're going to use RAID 1 or mirroring in between our RAID volumes. So RAID 10 is the way you work around the slow performance of the block storage environments in the cloud. Now, I have to, I have to, you have to understand this. RAID 10 is a fortune, because if you need 50 drives in your RAID 0 volume, your backup volume is also going to need 50 drives. So you're probably not going to use 50, but the point is, is RAID 10 gets real expensive real fast because it doubles your drive. RAID 10 will give you better performance than any other RAID flavor because you're getting the speed and performance of RAID 0 and a complete and total backup. So it's becoming increasingly popular as organizations move to the cloud. They have to find a way to get somewhat acceptable disk performance. And because of that, they're going to RAID 10. So RAID 10 is the fastest. It's just expensive. But on the cloud, you don't really have a good idea, a, a good option if you need if you need to get good disk performance and redundancy. So let's look at this architecturally. Note what we have here. We've got a RAID 0. RAID's block 1, block 2, block 3, block 4, block 5, block 6, block 7, block 8 on our two drives. Note, you've got RAID 1. So on the second array where it says RAID 0, it's an identical copy to what you have in the first RAID 0 array. So it's just a RAID 0 array backed up with another RAID 0 array. And there you got it. Now you know how we deal with high performance storage in the cloud. Because, because block storage isn't very fast and it's relatively high latency compared to what you would do in the data center, we just use RAID. Give ourselves speed, redundancy, and things work great. So, you know, on the way to next, which is Elastic File System, I want to see if there's any questions on RAID. So type hashtag cloud hired in the box if you're having fun. So I know you're still here, awake, alert, and oriented. And also, you know, if you've got any questions or there's been any questions in the last few minutes, Chris, if you want to bring them up to the screen. And if not, um, we can, uh, we can uh, basically take these questions. So Babita Shah, AWS, does use RAID 10. Absolutely. Jesse Murdoch, RAID 5 is fascinating. You want to come meet with the person who came up with the concept? Me too. I've used RAID 5 now. It is the best thing in the world to give you speed, redundancy, and as cost-effective as can be. I'd like to meet that person as well. Talking about durability, is it specific to AWS Cloud, or do all cloud providers have the same storage durability? Um, Komibi, uh, for the most part, everybody is different. You should always check with the cloud provider to determine their service level agreements because they're all different. Is there any other questions there, Chris? Mario, can I go over storage gateway? We definitely will be going over storage gateways when we talk about migrating data to the cloud. Absolutely.
Leonarders there, Chris? As a cloud art, Pierre Lincoln, as a cloud architect, would I recommend RAID 5 to my client? I recommend RAID 5 to my clients every single day with their hybrid clouds. So in most cases, there's no such, uh, um, there's no such thing um, as uh, just going all the cloud. It's typically part data center, part cloud, those kind of things. So that's typically what we're dealing with. So I'm always recommending RAID 5 something to use in the data center. But on the cloud, I typically recommend RAID 10 because I don't have much of a choice because the performance of the cloud provider drives are very slow. So is any of this in the ebook? Our AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional ebook has each and every one of these things contained in them. Our Certified Solution Architect Associate book probably doesn't have RAID, but it has most of these concepts. Um, and Nash, the only kind of storage that we can use on AWS for RAID is going to be um, EBS volumes because everything else is going to be managed for us. SM7, day one alone convince you to take the course. That's great. Um, great info. Thank you. For database, which RAID do we have to use? Manohar, here's a question. It depends on the transactions. You may not use RAID at all in your database. Or you may be using RAID 10. Or you may be using RAID 1 to uh, give yourself a backup in real time. So with any of these things, it's all going to be related to the transactions in terms of the volume, input, output operations per second, and the throughput. So a database server might not use RAID ever, where it may need to use RAID 10. But it could be it's going to be based upon throughput and workload. Chris, any others? RAID 5 is super easy to recover. All that you do is you take out the bad volume, pop in a new volume, and typically ask your RAID array to rebuild. Super, super, super easy. So David Cho, OK, so here's a question for you. Does EBS and S3 use different RAIDs? Well, you can't choose a RAID option when you're using S3. You are stuck with whatever they give you. Now, I'm going to tell you behind the scenes. And AWS's RAID arrays, they're using some form of RAID 50 or RAID 5 in their environment for their storage, but not what they give to you. Those physical RAID arrays are all using some form of performance, speed, and redundancy, typically speaking, some flavor of, a, of RAID 5, like RAID 50. But having said all of that, um, EBS volumes are the ones where you can choose RAID, but you don't have any option with S3. But think about S3, it's object storage. Computers don't use object storage. They use block storage or file storage. The only time you can use object storage is with a storage gateway, but object storage is not for use with computers. It's for use by humans, sharing files, distributing software, <laughs> backups, but not computers don't mount an amount of object storage and use it like real storage. Chris, are there any others? Aqua, I'm so happy to see you here. Um, as an architect, is important a balance between the performance? Uh, I will tell you, as an architect, Aqua, it's going to be extremely important to balance throughput and IOPS. Durability, well, in theory, that's very important. About the, the durability is is how long your, the the chances of your data being good, meaning over time, like data getting actually lost. And you know, when you're dealing with like AWS and talking about 11 nines durability, that's incredible. So how do I manage durability of data? I run good backups as often as possible. Durability can be achieved by backups. So focus mostly on latency, IOPS, and throughput. But durability matters, and durability backups should be part of your durability maintenance procedure. Tyrone, so RAID 10 for database and RAID 5. So basically, look at it this way. RAID 5 is used everywhere for everything, just not on the cloud. And the databases could run. Most people will not use RAID for their databases. They won't need it. Most people will get away with a uh, uh, provision IOPS volume. And then most people will get away with the newest, fastest version of the provision IOPS volumes. Um, but having said all of that, you know, sometimes you need faster. And if you need faster because you've got a really incredible high transaction, high workload database, you might need to do RAID 0, but RAID 0 S2 is dangerous, so time around, you'll do RAID 10. 
Head over here is, does the RAID controller make a huge impact to real performance? In today's world, less than it used to be, but the answer is yes. So for those of you that are not familiar, you've got a server, and in the server, typically speaking, which we're not gonna be using here, you've got a controller card that is a hardware card that will that will you tell it the RAID version and it'll spread the load of your data going into the drives. This is a hardware card that does it all on the chips on the card. Now you can do RAID on a computer without a hardware RAID controller, but then the CPU is determining who go, which packets go where. So if you do RAID on the CPU, you eat into the server CPU performance. So realistically speaking, anytime you can offload the CEO, do all your graphics in the GPU, do all of your RAID on a card. Not only can you improve the performance and effectiveness of the solution, you can make your server scale because you're now decoupling the storage off of the CPU. So now the CPU has less things to do so the CPU can scale to more virtual machines or more compute. So that's typically why we do these kinds of things. So, so far we talked about EBS volumes today. We talked about instant storage volumes today. Now, actually, I think there's one or two more questions. And then after that, we have two options on the thing we do next. And I'm going to give you guys a choice. What is the difference between this SSD is in solid state hard drive and HDD isn't? So SSD drives are, 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 are digital hard drives, digital hard drives. So when we're talking about the EBS, we're talking about block storage that's made out of solid state drives. So solid state drives, low latency, relatively good throughput. HDD typically means hard drive, which is magnetic. HDD on the AWS cloud talks about their throughput optimized hard drives. So the throughput optimized hard drives have very good throughput, like 500 megabit a second, faster than the SSD drives in the AWS context. But the latency or the IOPS is, the latency is high because the IOPS is low. So it's a matter of choosing what you need. So moderate throughput applications, the HDD is perfect. Low latency applications, SSD is good. But when you need really low latency, like a database, you're gonna use a provision IOPS and then you're gonna be good to go. SM7, RAID 5 is used in every data center in the world. It's just that you don't do it in your cloud environment, which is a virtualized data center and a virtualized network. So the stuff that they're going to be running in the cloud providers to give you your block volumes, they're going to be using some version of RAID 5 on that. It's just that you don't use it when you're on the cloud. But a hybrid cloud or environment where an organization has their own cloud, they're going to be running RAID 5. Every organization is going to have RAID 5 in their data center. So RAID 5 is not going anywhere. It's everywhere. It's just not in the cloud except the infrastructure that makes the cloud possible, sure, that's also on RAID 5. So for the next section, you guys let me win and do. Before, we're gonna go next into EFS, but we have the opportunity. We have the opportunity to do a lab where we're gonna SSH into a compute instance and mount an EBS volume. Would you guys like to do a quick lab or would you guys like to stay on the content? Let me know by lab or content by typing in the chat box. And we'll either do a little more content or a little bit of a lab because we're going to go back and forth. It's up to you. We'll get the same content on each day. Tell me what's going to give you guys the most fun. Okay, I see one content, one lab, lab, lab. Okay, lab, lab, content, content. Ooh, this is going to be tough. Lab. It's like it's a half and half, Mike. <laughs> I think it's I'm seeing more labs. So Alonzo, why don't you come in, do a nice lab with everyone, give everybody a chance to play with the tech, maybe get a little excited about the tech, have a little bit of fun, and then I'll go back to what I'm doing is loving teaching. So Alonzo, you want to do that first lab? That sounds like a fun thing to do. Now, everyone, if you all are ready, if you all are on your VPCs, um, already in your AWS account, let me know. I'll give you just a few moments, and then we'll start jumping into the uh, EC2s. Sounds great. Alonzo will do a nice 10-minute lab. Then we're going to get into content. We're going to have a party, and I'm sure we'll do another lab. So 
I'll turn it over to you, Alonzo. So which lot you're going to do? Are you going to set up uh, the EC2 instance amount of EBS volume, or do you have an S31? What's next on your list? What we're going to do is that we're going to uh, we're going to start up and spin up an EC2. We're going to spin up a EBS volume. We're going to attach that EBS volume to the instance, and then we're going to SSH into that instance on the command line. Sounds like a lot of fun. So I hate the term instance. And I hate the term EC2. The reason I hate the term EC2 is Elastic Compute Cloud doesn't mean anything in my mind, but virtual machine is. So he's going to create a virtual machine, virtual <laughs> EC2 instance. And inside of that virtual machine, he's going to mount a block storage drive called an EBS Viome. He's going to secure shell into it with you, which is going to be a party. And he's going to walk you through the configuration. So let's have some party time. Let's go, guys and gals. Whenever you're ready, let's just. Everyone say go when you're ready, and then we'll begin. I think they're ready, Alonzo. There's a 60 to 90 minute uh, latency. So I'm going to hear I'm ready right around the time you start demoing it. OK, we're going to jump right in. OK, everyone. So I'm assuming everyone is logged in onto your uh, AWS um, management console. So what we're going to do first is I'd like to create an EBS volume. So go to your, I'm going to uh, just illustrate it so that we can all be on the same page. We're going to our EC, uh, EC2 dashboard. We're going to scroll down to our EBS area. Looking for it right now. Where's our block storage of volumes? There we go. We have our elastic block store. We're going to select volumes. We're going to create a volume. We're going to just do general purpose where it's just all around good thing to have. It's just, you know, it's got the right amount of latency. Uh, uh, reduction's got a right, right amount of throughput. And we're just going to keep it generalized for our specific example. For me, I'm going to be in US East 2B. We don't have any snapshots or anything else to attach or reference. So because we have a brand new um, EBS volume to work with. You can add a tag, but for me, for this example, I'll add tag and then I'll say my EBS. Then I'll create the volume. Volume has been successfully created. We're going to close this window and let me know if I'm going too fast for everyone because I, I want everyone to get the great, the best experience possible here. Okay. So explain what you just did there. What I just did is that I um, I turned on and actually activated an EBS volume, a GPS2, and now I spun it up. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move over to my EC2 and create one. Then I'm going to attach this EBS volume to that new EC2 or VM, a uh, virtual machine, as Mike likes to call it. So now I'm in the EC2. Um, hey, uh, Alonzo. Yes. Where, is there a way that you might be able to increase the uh, view of the web browser? Actually, I can. OK. How's that for everyone? Excellent. Much better. Thank you. OK, perfect. OK. So I'm checking to make sure um, EBS is running. So now I'm going over to my launch instance dashboard. We're going to pick the free tier. So as we're going to be, um, we're going to be using a Linux machine because it's going to work really well on the command line. And make sure, like we were uh, like we were discussing before, 
Um, if you do have your AWS account, you're going to have a free tier for an entire year. So spend is, you know, spin up those, those free resources. It's not going to cost you anything. But like yeah. Alon just taught you to yesterday, make sure you set the budget ahead of time, just in case. Yes. Yes. Make sure it's something that you can afford. Uh, for me, this, this, like we were referencing before, I've spun up tons of EC2 instances and a lot of different resources, and I still have yet to amount to a full dollar. So right hey, here, here. Alonzo, um, Derek asked, uh, how did you activate the volume? Okay, let's go back. Okay, so once I created that volume, we go through volume type, size, the specific availability zone of, uh, of your subnet that you're going to put this in. You, we don't have any snapshots to reference, so no worries there. You can add a new tag for your specific instance, and then you're going to create that volume. Thank you. So right now, I am back to choosing an instance type. Then I'm going to configure that instance. We only want one instance. And then when we're uh, creating this instance, we it's very important. You see a whole lot of buttons here, but don't get intimidated by this. We're going to go through all of them or most of it and how it references our uh, specific virtual machine. So right here in our network, I've already had my VPC created. I'm going to my, my personal um, chosen subnet, which is in uh, East uh, US East 2B. I'm going to enable my auto assign public IP. Anything else pretty much after that is really not going to be in reference or in relationship to our specific example, capacity reservation, I am roles. Um, but right here, when we want to do look at the shutdown behavior, you can decide on the moment that you decide you don't need that uh, particular uh, virtual machine slash EC2, you can decide to just stop that turn, uh, stop it. And so that you can reference to turn it back on at a later date, or you can just have it terminated immediately. So for this example, we want to just stop it. And right here with the tenancy, uh, what we have right here is that uh, we don't have a dedicated host. We don't have any dedicated areas. We don't have our own uh, servers um, or reserved instances or anything um, like that at AWS. We just have something shared where this particular instance is going to sit in a subnet with other people using the same uh, same rack, if you will. And so now we're going to move on and add storage. So with this, this is where we have, um, um, we don't need to add, we can add a storage right here, but we're going to do it on the EBS side. So we can just reference um, the root version at this point in time. Add tags, name, and I like to just SSH. Our tag right here, configure. I already pre-made a security group, so I will reference create new security group. But for you, what you would probably need to do is, for example, I have um, a security group where it specifically focuses on SSH TCP protocol. SSH always uses port 22, okay? But I'll cancel a lot of this because I already have what I need. Oh my goodness, made a mistake there. Okay, that's what it is about being live. It happens. You have computers that fail, all kinds of fun stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We overcome and adapt, right, Mike? Adapt, improvise, overcome. Yesterday, we reinstalled an operating system and all the apps in an hour so we could do yesterday's <laughs> YouTube live stream. And I went to switch to my backup notebook uh, that I just ordered a week ago <laughs> to try and get set up oh, in yesterday's 10 minute break. So, yep, that's what we do. And said the only easy day was yesterday. Oh, yes. So we have 
we've already selected our stuff right here. This is my SSH test. Again, uh, we SSH, TCP protocol, port 22 range. We're going to review all of our selections right here. We have our instance type, a TC micro. We have our chosen security group, which is our SSH test 04, and it's going to SSH2 EC2s. These are always a good thing to reference, especially when you're new to AWS, about how and to what to look for and how certain resources know how to reference and choose um, throughout the AWS environment. So right now, everything looks great. We're going to launch. We already have our existing key pair. We ignite, and this is so important right here is because when you choose your key pair, you have to remember this because this is what the security references are going to be looking for um, on your command line. If you don't have it, you're going to have to start this all over again. So we're launching our instance. And we're going to go back to the uh, to the dashboard. So for illustrative purposes, I've set up the EC2. Now what I'm going to do is use my existing EC2 that I've already uh, spun up and, and is associated with my SSH. So I'm going to start that instance back up. Let me know if I'm going too fast for everyone. It takes a little couple of seconds for them to come up. Still a lot faster than it would be installing an operating system on a physical server. Definitely. That would be a whole lot longer. <laughs> and note why people like the cloud. Alonzo didn't go order one from Dell or Lenovo or HP. It didn't take six weeks to get it. Nobody had a racket. No one had installed an operating system cable. It was quick. This is the benefit of the cloud, the agility. So when you hear talk, me talk about performance of the data center being greater, it is. But you don't have this agility. This agility is amazing. Yes, yes, indeed. So now, right now, I have the SSH E202. That is the name of my instance. It's up and running. So now we're going to move back over to the EBS. And what we're going to do is that we're going to attach that volume. We'll wait for it to, to attach and spin up. Got a couple of questions. Um, so Jeannie asked, uh, so you skip the instant storage and are attaching the EBS storage? Yes, I OK. And the reason we're doing this, Jeannie, is with instant storage, it all goes away with reboot. So by doing it this way, we're going to keep it after a reboot. Um, and then there was a one before that. Uh, Daniel Green asked if uh, security groups are instance-based. They're more service-based. So a security group is effectively a host-based firewall. You typically use it on a virtual machine or an EC2 instance, but you could also use it in a few other places. So think of it as a service or like a host-based firewall to protect a, a compute a computer or a service. Okay, so now we're back over into the EC2 console. Okay, so now this is the part where we're going to uh, connect uh, the EC2 via SSH. Now I'm going to shrink my screen and I will be jumping on to the command line. Okay, so usually like Mike said before, we do not configure, we architect, we create these things. So I'm able to, through definitely lots of trial and error in, the, um, in my initial experiences with AWS, the command line is still a great uh, skill to have to learn simple Linux commands on how you would navigate around and through. Um, 
and creating SSH uh, connections to EC2. So I'm going to clean out my terminal. I'm going to set command, command documents forward slash SSH. So now that gives me, um, I just basically with command documents forward slash SSH, I have asked my command line to look into this particular folder for my, my PIM key. I'm going to list it, ls. It's there. So now I'm going over here and I'm grabbing through the SSH client. I am grabbing command, uh, they call it Shamad 400, but it's command mode 400. So what he's doing is he's changing the permissions of the file with regards to the read, write, and execute. So the change chmod command for the, your non-Unix users, non-Linux people, is how you would change the permissions. Like chmod 777 is full read, write, full control, full execute for everyone. chmod 400 is really about giving you just enough permissions to actually get inside there on, on your, your key. Exactly, and, and they always specify with AWS, least per, you know, just give everybody the permissions that they need the, the most, no more, no less. So now I add in uh, my, my, my using my public DNS to connect to my EC2 instance. And now we're connected via SSH. Now you can do things like LS, which will be, which will list the files that are there and, and any other kind of things that you would see for a Unix environment. So not only do we have our um, EC2 is activated, the EBS is attached to that EC2 instance, and now we're able to remote access via the command line to that particular instance. Does everyone else, how, how does everyone feel about that particular example? I personally think you did a great job with it. Let's hear from the audience. Um, love that you showed what it is. Um, the instance, love how you showed how you mounted the Viam. Um, prior to moving on with more content, does anybody have any questions for Alonzo or me? I see something about logging into PuTTY. PuTTY is usually um, an example of where you're logging into a Windows instance. As I'm working on a Mac, that wouldn't work for me, but we can try to do something similar to that maybe later on if Mike uh, would like to do so. Sure. So PuTTY is just a secure cell client. We used to use it for Telnet. We also used it for SSH. See, when you're dealing with Unix and Linux systems, it's all based on secure shell. But Windows is not. Windows, if anything, is remote desktop. So Windows doesn't have the best networking tools in it, whereas Linux and Unix systems do. So all these kind of things that we typically do from a Linux or Unix systems. Now, a Mac runs BSD Unix, which is why the Mac is so stable. Until you're doing video editing things. And um, then the Macs become very unstable very fast. And I know from experience because I had a 16 core $12,000 Mac that used to crash on me once a day, which is why I switched to Windows. Now my systems only crash on me once a month. So I'm doing better with the Windows than the Mac. Although I really miss, um, you don't do the, if you, if you lose the, uh, perm, the key, you've got a problem. You're going to have to log you back in. You got to go through all of that over again. Now, one thing. account. And then you're going to have to create a new SSH key to log in. Yes, log in. definitely. Now, when I when I did everything, now if I were to stop that instance and try to go back in again and use the same situation, it would not work because you have to add in an elastic IP address. And Mike, could you explain what an um, EIP is? Yeah. So. Realistically speaking, there are times where you need a public facing IP address or a globally routable address. And when you need a globally routable address, it must be unique. So typically we'd go to an internet service provider, we'd apply for one through RIPE or ARN, we'd get an IP address that's assigned to us, it takes a process to get one. Now in this particular environment, when an elastic IP address is we need a public IP address, we just borrow one from Amazon. We temporarily rent it for as long as we need. So when you're talking about a public IP address on AWS, they call it an elastic IP address. Because guess what? Stick the word elastic in front of something, and you pretty much can figure out what AWS is going to name it. <laughs> if it comes from Google, it's got the word cloud in front of most things. And with Azure, often you'll find Azure in front of most things. So that's kind of your way to figure out which vendor's got the service, too. Um, 
for Windows, mean, almost everybody uses PuTTY. Yes. Um, for Linux and Unix, it's built and baked right in. Which SSH client did I use? Now, normally what I do is, because I'm working on a Mac, I would reference Homebrew. I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with that, but it's uh, a lot. It's a, definitely, it's a wonderful, or used to be a wonderful command line uh, resource, uh, specifically where you're able to use um, Homebrew. They'll give you a certain amount of commands that you can reference, and then it'll set everything up for you. Now, because um, PuTTY is no longer used, or rather, ADA, or rather uh, Mac does not prefer to use uh, Homebrew because Homebrew just leaves everything wide open. Security risk, of course, especially in this day and age, basically with all the shutdowns and, and uh, malware and, and everyone being held hostage for their resources, that's not the preferred resource. So now um, Mac prefers that you use uh, get on their app store and go through this reference called Xcode. And, and now and, we're using. And, and you can definitely use that. But yes. the terminal that comes native with the Mac, if you do nothing, is designed for SSH, just like the terminal that comes with every Linux machine you can use and you need to install nothing. He's doing something a little cooler. But for those of you guys that are there, all you really need to do is just open a terminal window and you're good to go. Yes. Yes. There's definitely two ways to do it. But definitely, I prefer just using the, uh, the terminal and just going for it and enjoying and just experimenting. You're going to go through a lot of trial and error uh, like I did initially. Um, you're going to rack your brain, but it's really simplistic. Just think linear, um, from a linear uh, perspective, linearly, I can never say that word, and just go with the process and just simplify it. it keep everything simple and you will arrive and you'll be able to access your EC2 via SSH command line. Yeah, anytime you've got a Linux Unix system, it's built in. So, you know, either use as part of the Unix Linux, use uh, use PuTTY with your with Windows. And I guess you, if you're a Windows, Windows, you can install the Ubuntu kernel, which is the Windows subsystem for Linux, and then use those tools natively as well, right? Because natively built into Windows and Unix. Pierre Lincoln, do you need to confirm the storage attached to the instance or CLI? You should definitely confirm it that it's attached either through the CLI or the management console. Absolutely. In real life, you always build and then confirm. So definitely, definitely, definitely. Yes, Mike, um, if I could, I would just like to show another example. Um, if they'd like to see it, I will share my screen again. You know, the only health checks that, we, that I use that aren't custom made are those with load balancers, as well as those with DNS. It is possible to create a custom health check for your system and use it, um, but that's basically pretty application dependent. Most of the health checks that are used industrially, or almost all of them, are related to health checks via load balancers and health checks via DNS. Because I am not a, uh, the sysops people, or the people that do the maintenance are really good at spending all day looking inside these systems. We architecture system designers, so it's not my strength. Alonzo is also an architect, so we don't spend all day troubleshooting that as a sysop part of the world. Yeah. Very different career. So we have, um, remember where we SSH client um, into the command line, but now you can also check behind this with instant connect to make sure everything is running. So you can simply click and forget, and it will spin it up and double check to make sure you're good to go. So now you can see via the command line and instance connect, everything is good to go and that you are ready to uh, do whatever you need to do via the command line, which is usually the engineers. Uh, that's where we hand it over to the engineers and let them do their thing. So that's just something that I wanted to just share with you all about how you can double check. Sounds great. Okay, <laughs> let's get back to some content. So Alonzo, seriously, thank you. You showed how to start a virtual machine. You started how to mount uh, some network-based storage, block storage. You talked about going in. So really great job. Thank you. And uh, we'll come back to it very soon. Um, let's get back into a little bit more of the technology. You know, and this is kind of great. Can you guys all see me? Okay, great. So now, so let's talk about the Elastic File System. So if any of you have ever worked in an environment where you're dealing with network storage, meaning one server 
and lots of people use the same information at the same period of time, that's file storage. So when you're dealing with Unix systems and you're dealing with Linux systems, guess what? We use Linux file systems. And you know what Linux file systems are? NFS, Network File System, the file storage system that was made by Sun Microsystems, I don't know, 30 years ago, which then got bought by Oracle. So every Linux and Unix system in the whole world, for the most part, uses the network file system. It's POSIX compatible software, and everybody who's everybody always uses this. So when you're in the cloud, of course, Amazon has their own brand of elastic file storage. And you know what their own brand of elastic file storage is called? Their own brand of network file storage is called elastic file storage. Because when you're dealing with AWS, what's actually going on is you're, you're dealing with um, the storage environment and there's, and they call everything NFS. So let's talk about the Elastic File System. The Elastic File System is based on NFS. So it's very similar to the Unix, Linux, NFS. Now we've got two versions of it. We've got standard for high performance and we've got infrequent access for files that we don't use that often. And then we've got two options with regards to performance, burstable or provisioned. Here's what burstable things are. And burstable is 30 years old. Burstable frame relay, burstable storage, here's what you got. You pay for a normal thing, here's your storage, normal storage, normal storage, and then you need, need it enables you to use above your typical and then goes back to standard. Burstable means if there's extra capacity, you can use it. The alternative is you provision your storage. I need this many IOPS, I need it now and every day. Provision it, what do you think you're gonna do? If you've got high performance needs, provision it ahead of time, maximize it, make it what you need. What are you gonna do if you don't have high performance needs? Burst. So with anything else, you the architect, it's up to you to build the best design based upon your customer's requirements. It's, so that's up to you. So now you know exactly what to do based upon what the customers desire. So that should give you some pretty good information as with regards to what you need to do and which one. So when we're talking about the Elastic File System, we're talking about POSIX compatible. This means if you've got any legacy systems in your environment that use your storage, it's gonna work. Some other cool things about the Elastic File System, because there's some versions that are really cool. Yes, it's just NFS with an Amazon brand, but it scales. Not only does it scale, it scales automatically. So if you run out of storage, it just bumps up capacity, capacity, auto grows. Now, for those of you that are not data center people, realistically speaking, not data center people, and you've never had to work with, okay, you think you need one terabyte, but then you have 100 terabytes, and then you think you need 200 terabytes, and they have like 10 petabytes, scaling automatically is incredible. It stops all the capacity planning. Basically, you've got storage and it just grows. There's nothing better from an agility perspective in tech than having storage that grows. Now also, we've got good throughput with these Elastic File System volumes, relatively high OPS, so low latency. So now let's look a little bit about this. So when we're actually looking at these, uh, these Elastic File System use cases, let's look at it in a different context. Basically, we've got our file system. We've got a whole bunch of servers that mount that same file system. So this is you being in the corporate environment where everybody's reading data off of the same server. Imagine having 10 web servers that serve the same content. They could all serve it directly off of this Elastic File System volume. So network storage, this is traditionally file storage. You've got a file server. Your file server is using Windows, guess what? Or Linux or both file storage, but with Linux or Unix you're in the data center using NFS. And in the cloud, specifically the AWS cloud, you guess what you're using? Using EFS, which is AWS branded network file system fully managed for you. So let's talk about the last version of file storage in the cloud. Now remember, you could easily start a virtual machine and then you could share a block storage volume and you would have network storage. Or, but you could also do this. That's what you would do with Danny You can also use file servers. And Amazon has these hosted Windows file servers called FSX or Windows File Server. 
And you know what these are? Nothing more than Windows servers. So basically you've got fully managed Windows file servers that use the SMB or server message block protocol. So you can basically work with your Windows clients. So basically if you've got things like quotas and Active Directory, this is gonna be your Windows file systems for Windows workloads. It's completely, completely uh, managed for you by the cloud provider. Basically you create a server, you configure your file server shares like you would any other file server. You connect your files to the shares and then you run your applications. That's exactly speaking, you know, what you kind of want to do. And that's how you get these things working perfectly. So now we're going to talk about sending data to AWS. And I know there's been some questions about storage gateways and fun things. So EFS is for Linux. File systems for Windows is for Windows. The only other way you could serve Windows file systems from Linux would be to create a Samba SARE or server's message block protocol on Linux. And you could do this, but NFS, EFS when the, for Linux and Unix clients, FSX for Windows clients. So prior to going into sending data to AWS, if you guys can leave a like if you're enjoying the comment. And if you've got any questions, let me know. Otherwise, type in cloud hired in the block and please box and please leave a like. We know you're enjoying the content. Please feel free to share with others. Let's talk about getting your data to AWS. So there's a lot of ways you can get your data to AWS. First, you can send it over the network, which is what we're going to talk about now. You could, for example, send your data on hard drives, which I'll talk about. You can send your data over ruggedized computers. But now we're going to talk about sending it over the network. The network. So how do you do it? AWS has a really great service called a storage gateway. Now a storage gateway is basically an appliance that you have that you connect in your data center and it will basically send your data to the cloud for you. So a storage gateway is a way to over the network that you have, whether it's your direct connection or your VPN, send your data to the cloud. And what a storage gateway is under the terms of AWS is a virtual machine they give you. So it's a, it's either a VMware or, Hyper, or Microsoft Hyper-V virtual machine. You're gonna install this virtual machine in your data center. Now this virtual machine is great for hybrid clouds or as well as when you're migrating your data to the cloud. It's phenomenal for disaster recovery or backup purposes. So there's, realistically speaking, a couple of storage gateways we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the volume gateway, and then we'll talk about the file gateways. And we'll talk about each and every one of these options, how to do this. But basically, we're going to begin with the storage. We'll begin with the storage gateway, specifically the file gateway. Here's what a file gateway is. It's an appliance or virtual machine you put in your data center. And it's going to act like a file server. And I'll draw this out for you in a minute. Your users in your data center and your or users in your company are going to mount to the file server, which is this virtual machine. And this virtual machine is going to copy all that data to the cloud. So effectively, the storage gateway is a bridge between your organization's data and the object storage in the cloud. Remember, object storage is not real storage. Computers cannot use object storage as if it's real storage. But object storage is still important. So here's what we can do here. We can take the storage, we mount it to the, to the storage, and then files get copied. So let's walk through the process here, architecturally speaking. Let me walk you through this. So basically, here's what you do. In your data center, what you're, you're doing is you, you install this storage gateway. And your application servers connect to the storage gateway. For example, if they're Windows, they connect over the service message block protocol. Or if they're Linux Unix system, they connect over NFS. So then you take your information to the storage gateway, which acts like a server, and then it rides your network connection, whether it be a direct connection, whether it be a VPN connection, and then it puts your data on AWS. So here what you can see is we've created a lifecycle policy. It takes our data, puts it on S3. If we don't use it, move it to S3 and frequent access. If they don't use it after that, 
move it to Esther Glacier. So realistically speaking, that's what we're talking about in these storage gateway environments. We're talking about creating a server in your data center, basically mounting that server, and it pushes your content to the cloud. So that is a file gateway. Great way to get your information to the cloud if you have the network bandwidth. So I want you to think about migrating your data to the cloud this way. If you've got a 100 gigabit ethernet connection and you don't have a ton of data, you can do it fast this way. If you've got a 10 gigabit connection and 20 terabytes of data, it's gonna go fast this way. If you have a one gigabit connection and 10 petabytes of data, guess what? You're not gonna be in a good position this way. So realize that you can transfer everything over the network but the key is how long it's going to take, which is going to be based upon the files you have and the bandwidth that you have and the quality of your links. So now we're going to talk about two other ways that we can use storage gateways. And these are more designed for these hybrid cloud sort of environments. The first thing that we'll talk about is a volume gateway in stored mode. And here's what a volume gateway stored mode is used for. If you have an organization that keeps primarily their data in the data center, but they want to asynchronously back it up to the cloud, this volume gateway stored mode is awesome. Here's what happens. Your data will be consistently backed up to the cloud. Consistently backed up to the cloud. So you'll stall your storage gateway. Your devices will mount to the storage gateway via the iSCSI protocol and your information will be just copied to the cloud. It's really the coolest thing ever. So let's look at it very carefully with regards to what we're doing. You've got your users connect, who connect to their application servers, who basically connect um, via iSCSI to your storage gateway virtual machines, and your information gets put pushed into S3. There you go. It's wonderful. It's magical. It's brilliant. It's automatic. Some things on the cloud are just so cool. This is one of them. Now this is if you keep your data in the data center. But what if you keep your data center in the cloud, your data in the cloud? Lots of organizations are using the cloud because cloud storage in some cases is cheaper than data center storage. So let's say you're one of these organizations. If you want to keep most of your data stored in S3, remember you can't use object storage by computers unless you bridge them together. So you can use a VIAM gateway in cache mode. And what it's going to do, it's going to connect your organization to the Amazon Simple Storage or the object storage on the cloud. And it's going to make the object storage on the cloud feel local to you. In fact, the VIAM gateway cache mode is like a content delivery network of your own data, of your own data. So that's kind of realistically speaking what's going on in these particular cases. So now let's look at this architecturally speaking. You've got your users, they connect to their servers, but in this case, most of your data is actually sitting in the cloud. So what's going on is I request information from the application servers. The application servers go to the cloud and get it. They bring it back. They store it to the storage gateway cache, volume gateway cache mode. They store it and cache it in there, and then they send the information back to me. So the next time a user wants to get something and they hit the application server, which hits the cache, it gets sent back to them. So this is kind of like a content delivery network, but for your own data. So a volume gateway cache mode is designed for the following. It's designed when your data is on the cloud, but you want it to look and feel local sitting in your data center. So that is what a volume gateway cache mode is. So let's go through our options one more time. We, realistically speaking, had three environments that we talked about. Here's the storage gateway. We take our information, we mount it via NFS or SMB, and we just copy our stuff to the cloud. Now, if we want to keep our data in the data center and back it up to the cloud, we use a volume gateway stored mode. Where we mount to our, we take our users, we take our application servers, we mount them to the storage gateway and our information is asynchronously copied to S3. Now, the last version of this is the volume gateway cache mode. This is optimal for organizations that keep their data on the cloud. See what happens in the data center, 
you the data center mounts to the storage gate the volume gateway cache mode and it pulls the information from the data center and i mean the cloud and gives it to you in your data center so that's realistically speaking what's going on here volume gateway cache mode pulls the information from s3 sends it to your users caches it so the next time where users request the same content they get it so now you know about a volume gateway cache mode so now let's talk about some more ways to get your data for the cloud, and then we'll do some questions. So if you have enough time and a good network connection, the best way to get to the cloud is quite simply transfer it over the network. But what if you don't have time? What if you've got like 300 terabytes of data, a, a one gig network connection, and a couple in like two weeks. You don't have enough time to get your data there. But what you can do is you can get something called a snowball from AWS. What is a snowball? If you've got a lot of data in a short period of time, you go to AWS and you request something called a snowball. It is a ruggedized computer. Ruggedized computer. And because it's a ruggedized computer, what's going on? You basically stick this ruggedized computer on your network. It's got a 10 gig in network interface. You copy your data onto the Snowball, which is a ruggedized computer filled with hard drives. It's got a 80 terabyte version and a 50 terabyte version. The 50 terabyte version has about 40 terabytes usable capacity. The 80 terabyte version has about 72 bytes usable capacity. After the drives are formatted, you copy your data onto the Snowball. It's encrypted. You call AWS and then you ship it back to them and they pick up it up and they put it back on S3. So Snowball, they send you a specialty computer, copy your data to the specialty computer, and it gets shipped back to AWS, and AWS people do it for you. So it's kind of a cool thing. You know, architecturally speaking, here's what it looks like. You request the Snowball, AWS will give it to you. You put your data, they pick it up. Data is loaded on the AWS S3 for you by the AWS personnel. Now, if it's Snowball, meaning the 72 terabyte version or the 80 terabyte version after formatting isn't enough, and maybe 10 of them isn't enough, and maybe 20 of them isn't enough, then you gotta start thinking big. So that's where this snowball bill concept comes from. And this snowball bill concept is really cool. Basically, if you are moving a massive data center, AWS will ship you this 45 foot long shipping container that's got 100 petabytes of storage in it. So it's a data center on wheels. Basically, it gets shipped to you. You copy all your stuff to this data center, and then somebody mounts this, uh, what do you call it? Mounts the shipping container on a tractor trailer, drives it back, and then it's copied to S3. This is an amazing service. This is not cheap either because you're basically getting a tractor trailer full of storage that's delivered to you and that has to be driven back. But you know, what a way to migrate a data center. Fantastic. So snowmall, lots of data, short period of time. Snowmobile, monster amount of data that you want to send to AWS in a short period of time. Now, what is the third version of shipping your data? Well, this one's easy. This is called the AWS Import Export Service. Here's what an Import Export Service is. Basically a rental USB hard drive. You basically copy your data on the drive, ship it to AWS, and they will copy your data for them. So, you know, that's the import-export service. So, now you know. Now, we're going to talk about one last thing before we get to computing. And computing is a really fun thing to talk about. We're going to talk about Amazon Work Docs because we've talked about anything that could potentially be considered storage on the cloud. So that the last kind of storage in the cloud, we'll call it Amazon Work Docs. It is a fully managed, secure content creation service, storage service, collaboration source. Think Google Drive, think Dropbox. And Amazon Work Docs enables collaboration on creative projects. It enables shared document editing. It's simple and affordable. It basically is accessed via a web or software client via Windows or Mac OS. Um, it's, it meets all your regulatory compliance standards, HIPAA, PCI, DSS, all those kind of things, ISO. So, Okay, so next on our agenda is actually going to be computing. But prior to getting computing, I think we should ask some more questions. So let's take the first question. Um, from the crowd, Chris. So let me see if I can see the questions. Hold on one second. Um, Chris, uh, 
Can we use RAID in a storage gateway cache mode? Doreen, you're not going to need to. So why are we actually using RAID? We're using RAID to improve speed, capacity, and performance. What we're doing here is we're just pulling information, so we don't really need to do it. Um, realistically speaking, the best way to do this, Doreen, would be to put it on a server with an NVMe drive or something that's very high performance. A standard NVMe drive out of the box that you would put on a server in your data center will perform three to five times faster than using a provision um, IOPS volume in the cloud. And guess what? A good um, server will have better disk performance than 10 to 20 EBS volumes in a RAID 0 array anyway, so you don't need to, Doreen. The key is making sure you use um, really good quality um, storage on your servers that are going to have that volume gateway installed in your data center. Mario Millen, what about a tape gateway? I was going to cover the tape gateway, but that's exclusively covered on the Certified Solution Architect Professional. Here's what a tape gateway is. A tape gateway is the following. Normally in organizations that have tape backups and they've put physical tapes, the tape gateway is a virtual tape that uses the organization's current tape infrastructure and it backs it up onto the AWS cloud using virtual tape. That's what a tape gateway is. Um, we cover that in the Certified Solutions Architect Professional in much more depth. Um, I know you're one of my students, so we can cover that in class if you desire as well. Chris, bring up the next one. Is a, v as a, via as a VM gateway another name for a VM gateway? I don't know the term VM gateway, Jeannie. I know the term VM gateway. Um, and I know storage gateway and cache gateway. VM gateway could be the same. But I don't really use acronyms or, or terms. And the reason I don't is they get easily confused. So for example, when I first started working in networking, somebody said, this client has a lot of PVCs. They were talking about permanent virtual circuits. And I said, administer a lidocaine bolus. And they said, what are you talking about? I said, you said the patient has too many premature ventricular contractions. Give a lidocaine bolus. And they looked at me like I had four heads. See, the problem is every one of these uh, acronyms has at least 10 meetings. So I don't know what VM gateway is, Jeannie. I wish I could help you. But it probably is an abbreviation for volume. Could we please explain a use case for EFS? Yes, absolutely. Network file storage is used anytime multiple servers need to use the same storage at the same time. So if you've ever been on a Windows computer and worked in an environment, and if you've ever been in a Windows convert environment and worked, worked in an environment where you mounted a file and basically everybody could work on a shared document based on a file, guess what? That is um, file storage, server file storage. See, if you've ever worked in a Linux environment or a Unix environment and you've got a bunch of servers that all have to use the same files, that is exactly when you use NFS or EFS. So anytime you've got Linux systems that need to actually work off of a shared folder or a network, you're using elastic file systems or shared file systems. So look at it this way with regards to storage environments. Instant storage, fast performance storage that boots up the systems that goes away with reboot. Block storage, moderately decent performance storage that looks and feels like a regular hard drive, even though it's a network a storage area network that's used by the servers as a local hard drive. Object storage, a type of storage generating network that takes data, breaks it down into objects that's used for software distribution, storing code artifacts, basically backups, redundancy. File storage used by people and computers. File storage could be where everybody, one of the video editors keeps their videos so they can all elaborate collaboratively. It could be where a company keeps their documents or their software for their people all on a file server. That's when you would use NFS or Windows FSX for Windows based upon Windows or Linux. And then uh, that pretty much covers your storage types. So bring up the next question, Chris. How about Amazon FSX for Windows? When we covered that, that is file system for Windows. So when Unix uses NFS or EFS, Windows uses the server message block protocol and the AWS has hosted Windows servers called FSX for Windows. Were there any others there, Chris? Okay, I'm not assuming there's any others. If there are, we will definitely get to them. Alonzo, how many other labs do you have scheduled for today? Uh, what, do, what, are, 
when are your next labs so we can schedule them accordingly? Um, I believe we, um, it was more of a comprehensive grouped lab that we did all at once, but I can okay. do you if it's necessary. No, nope, we're, we're good to go. Okay. I know you actually, I wanted you to do something on S3, which you did. I wanted you to do something on EBS, which you did. I wanted you to do something with regards to an EC2 instance in SSH, which you did. So uh, let's go look at Aqua's question. Aqua is one of my students, has incredible questions. A big networking background too. With hybrid cloud data center deployment, are we always getting an estimates of the sizing using, e um, using the Amazon EFS compared to running your own SAN? Yes, exactly. So when you're doing a hybrid deployment, you have to determine a few things. One is where you would like your data to be stored. If your data is stored in your data center and you're using a hybrid cloud, guess what? Their performance is gonna be so much better because in your data center, you don't have any of the overhead of the cloud. You don't have any of these wide area network connections. You can have everything connected at 100 gigabit speed. It's easy. <coughs> so when you start thinking about taking things out of the data center and moving them to the cloud, you're gonna to have to deal with the performance constraints. Again, it can be dealt with. So you realistically have to look at what is the total cost of ownership. Sometimes, most of the time, it's cheaper to leave your data stored to the cloud, but not always. So yes, strongly recommend anytime you move anything to the cloud to make a full evaluation. How does it benefit to the customer? Is it better, faster, or cheaper? Is it cheaper and faster? Two out of three is typically what you're looking for. Um, file storage and object storage are very, very, very different. File storage is what computers can use. Object storage cannot be used by computers. Object storage is basically a dumping ground of stuff. Object storage is when you have something to write once and it's gonna be read many times. Object storage is where you store software to distribute. Object storage does not get used by computers. So file storage is what's in a computer. It's like your hard drive or it's a network drive. Object storage is like Google Drive. For example, very, very, very different kinds of storage. Yesterday, we talked a lot about block storage, object storage, and file storage. And if you missed that, I strongly recommend it. A lot of what we do as cloud architects is storage. And we covered those pretty intently and pretty deeply yesterday in the in the second half of the course. So I strongly recommend that. Um, Dave I and King, can you give an example using edge computing using a snowball? So I'm not going to do edge computing using a snowball. I'm going to do edge computing using a server, not a snowball. Now, AWS recently came up with this kind of a snowball-like sub thing where you could copy your data to it and you can mount it in a local zone and use it as a relatively high-performance hard drive. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to use an EBS volume or a RAID array, array or an EFS volume. So that's not something that I'm going to do. Um, the only reason I would use that is if it was in a hurry to cop it there and copy it to the edge. I'm going to get better data out of uh, one of the provision IOPS volumes and a RAID array than I ever would with the Snowball. So the Snowball for me is just a way to get my data to ship to AWS. I know a couple of days ago they came up with a new feature to let you do it. Here's the thing. When AWS released this new feature three days ago that said, hey, guess what? You can ship a Snowball to the cloud, to the edge, and you can mount your data and serve it there. They told you nothing, and then it's got SSD storage. They didn't tell you the IOPS. They didn't tell you the throughput. They told you literally nothing. You can't architect a design on no information whatsoever. So until that information is made public with regards to IOPS and throughput, it's not usable for any of us architects. It's still marketing wear. Now, if AWS informs us very soon, um, speed and throughput considerations, and if it gets better than the provision of LPS volumes, I'd be very interested in considering it. But I don't design things where we don't have performance specifications and they've released it about a week ago and they've listed no information about their performance. So not sure if it's really yet, not sure if it's something that's been designed that's not in production, not sure you know what's going on, but never do something unless I have the actual real data. And I think there's one more that we can ask and then we'll go back to the content. I, I don't know which one you want me to put up there. There's two of them. Okay, bring them both up. Okay, when to use block storage over object storage? 
We covered this extensively yesterday, so um, go back. please go back and review this. Anytime you have information that a computer needs to use, like a server, use block storage. Anytime you want to store information that's not going to be that's going to be for distribution, use object storage. Object storage is not usable by computers. You only use object storage as backups as well as to distribute large amounts of files. Use block storage as a real hard drive attached to a computer. So almost exclusively all your data will all all your computing will always be on block storage. Object storage is just going to be used for backups and for software distribution. Are we planning to go through some scenario questions where they ask about what storage should be used as a requirement? Um, we do that in our Cloud Architect Career Development Program. We actually teach people how to design end-to-end -end solutions. That's what we do in our Cloud Architect Career Development Program. We're running a, a certification course, and certification isn't that related to what people actually do as Cloud Architects. It's more of the name of the service and how to do it. So in, our, in a lot of our YouTube videos, we do do this. Um, where we talk about how to do it in our Cloud Architect Career Development Program. We do it all the time because that's realistically what we Cloud Architects do. We are running a certification course this week, so we have to we have to balance, you know, what's necessary to get you certified, um, and that's not necessarily the same as what we would treat. So all of our students do this in our Cloud Architect Training Program. That's part of architecture training, but today we're doing certification training. And does the storage gateway service require a license? You have to get it somehow from AWS. So, um, but you know, most of the time the licenses are included with these kind of things because you're paying for every megabyte that goes with them. So, Chris, I think we should go back to the content. So let's talk about computing. So when we're talking about computing, we're talking about one of two things. There's only two kinds of computing on the cloud. Virtual machines and containers. That's it. We're going to talk about virtual machines now. And when we cover AWS services, we'll spend a lot of time talking about containers. So when you're dealing with the cloud, remember what is the cloud? It's nothing more than a virtualized network and a virtualized data center. So everything you have in the data center is exactly what you're going to have in the cloud. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So in the data center, if you need a server with four cores, in the cloud, you need a server with four cores. In the data center, if you need a server with 128 cores, guess what you need in the cloud? A server with 128 cores. If you need a terabyte of RAM in the data center, you need a terabyte of RAM in the cloud. It's all the same. So when you're dealing with virtual machines in the cloud, which AWS calls EC2 instances or Elastic Compute Cloud, what you're dealing with is a virtualized server. That's it, virtual server. And you're going to size it and select it and architect it just like what you have in the data center. Now, granted, you may change it along the way. You may say, the server that I have in the data center is operating at 80%. I'm going to go to the cloud. I'm going to use a bigger one. Or you can go to the cloud and use two smaller ones. But you're always going to need the same functional capacity in the data center and the cloud, with one exception. In the data center, you must build for peak so for a retail organization, the peak is when, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Around Christmas in the US. Now, that's peak. So in the data center, you build for peak. In the cloud, you don't build for peak. In the cloud, you can say, OK, the server that I have with 120 cores is operating at 40%. Therefore, I can go to the cloud with a 64 core server and then use auto scaling to scale up in capacity as needed, which is technically scale out versus scaling up. But that's neither here nor there. Um, so that's what we're going to do. So we're going to size it just like we would everywhere, everywhere, everywhere else. CPU, memory, storage, and network performance. That is how we um, choose our devices. So let's look at uh, some of these things. Now, I am never going to tell you to memorize virtual machines. You're never going to hear me say that. But you know, it's generally often good to know the flavors of the instance types. For example, if you've got an ARM-based workload, you're talking about an A type A1 server. If you're dealing with compute optimized, you're talking about a C5 system. If you're dealing with GPUs, you're typically dealing with a G3. If you're dealing with the big stuff, you're typically dealing an X1. So 
here's a list you can look at. I'll keep the list here. I'll keep it up for a little bit, but that'll give you a flair. But you know, when it comes to me selecting a virtual machine, I don't do any of this. Um, I go every single time. I think of my, um, I think about my CPU requirements, my memory requirements, my network requirements, and then I go to the EC2 place or the Azure Virtual Machine Store or the Google Compute Engine Store, and I select a virtual machine that meets my needs based upon CPU, memory, disk, and network performance. Now let's talk about the kinds of systems you can use in AWS. So they now have virtual machines, which are Linux machines, Windows machines, and even Mac OS. Now, when you're getting one of these new Mac OS EC2 instances, it's basically a system that runs on a Mac mini. And a Mac mini is a great computer, but we're not talking about any mission critical systems. We're talking about a single power supply. We're not dealing with error correcting RAM. We're not dealing with Xeon CPUs that are designed to run 24 hours a day. They're basically home computers. So you can get a Mac OS EC2 instance that's designed basically to basically compile a Ma Apple code. Typically use case for these Macintosh things are because nobody's really running Mac servers is you've got to compile some code to launch a new app. You run it from AWS for a day. It's kind of great. Now the rest of your machine images are going to be one of the two flares. It could be Linux, which is primarily what organizations use for servers, but you could also have Windows. Some organizations have some Windows file servers, some. Most organizations have a Microsoft Active Directory that they use for uh, AAA authentication. You know, who are you? What are you allowed to do in accounting? Um, people call it IAM, Identity and Access Management. We'll talk a lot more about that when the time is appropriate. But just understand this that when we're dealing with the cloud, we've got virtual machines, Linux and Windows, or now Mac. Now, why you get these is pretty neat. It's not like the hard way. Like yesterday when I had a system crash in my home, I had to reinstall my operating system. I mean, you're getting these, it's really, really easy. So easy, here's what you realistically do. You click a few buttons like Alonzo just did and poof, your server's up. So realize you can get a pre-built virtual machine from AWS, it's the easiest thing. You want a Red Hat one, you want a Windows one, you want a, an Amazon Linux one, basically you just select it and you turn it on and it's up and running, it's amazingly fast. So when you're doing these, realize that you can you can make, take a pre-built machine and you get pre-built machines from Amazon. If you need any security appliances, like you need to do any high grade military grade security, you go to the marketplace and you'll get firewalls and, and proxy servers and, and uh, uh, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention system. So if you've got high security things, you can go to the marketplace and basically get a pre-made virtual machine in the form of an image. Or you know what you can do? You can take your servers in the data center and you convert them into virtual machines. Or you can create a virtual machine image out of a virtual machine that you created and modified. So a machine image is the greatest thing ever. So obviously I mentioned you can buy them. You can make one. Or you can basically take one of your current servers and, and convert it into a virtual machine. Or you, let's say you wanted to secure some, like a secure virtual machine for certain systems. You could take one of the AWS ones. You could disable all the unnecessary services. You could patch it. And you can create your own high secure golden image builds. You, these are one of the ways you do these kind of things. So let's talk about what goes into an Amazon machine image. An operating system, launch permissions, and a block device mapping that's gonna map the storage to the server. Remember, these machines, when they come up, they have a, a volatile hard drive, ephemeral hard drives. Upon stopping or rebooting, they all go away. So, now you know a little bit about these systems. So that's what goes into an MI. I'm gonna say it again, it could be a test question. An operating system, launch permissions, and a block device mapping that, map, that, that tells you where the storage volumes are. So you can make an MI, you can copy it to another region. Great disaster recovery. So I want you to think about this from a cheap disaster recovery perspective. What if you've got your data center and you make total images of every server that you have and then copy your data over? If your data center were to go down an outage, you could just launch the servers from the virtual machine AMIs that you copy to the cloud. Your data's already copied there. In about eight hours, you're up with the fully operational data center. And you know what it costs you to have this kind of disaster recovery capacity all this time? Almost none. Almost no time whatsoever. 
So that's why these AMIs are good. And you know what you could also do? You could back up. You know, let's say you're using AWS. You can make machine images of your things. Copy them over to Azure. So if AWS has a massive outage, you could lose, launch on, on, on Azure. Or better yet, you can launch them on both clouds at the same time. So just realize that. So you can make a snapshot. You can copy them. This image is the greatest thing ever. We've been using machine images since VMware for the last 20 years to make systems easier than trying to install an operating system. And we can do it on the cloud. It is exceptional. So let's talk about how to make this process more efficient. Alonzo showed you how to basically do this. It was pretty easy. But what if you wanted to make it better? Let's say, for example, you wanted to, you wanted to launch an Ubuntu Linux thing. Wouldn't it be nice if when the system came up, you could tell it to do the sudo opt-get update and upgrade all the packages so it would be fresh and fully updated by the time you start? That's what a bootstrap script is. So when you're dealing with servers coming up and down on their own and auto-scaling, if you can generate a script so they come up and they update themselves and install their applications, you've got magic. Set a policy when the CPU exceeds 60%, add 10 more servers, have the servers come up, install their own patches, install their applications and dependencies, and be up and running. No, no manual intervention. Automation at its best. So this is a really elegant thing. So we're always wanting to get our systems better and faster. So how do we do this? We write a bootstrap script. On the script, we install the applications, manage the software patch. With Linux, we write a simple shell script. With Windows, it's a PowerShell script. Super, super easy to use, and it's a great way to make your systems run great. So now let's talk about the kind of systems you actually purchase. And this determines your cost. And there's multiple options, but each one of these options has strengths and weaknesses. So the first thing that we'll talk about is the on-demand instance. You know what makes the cloud cool? On-demand. Why is cloud cool? Because here's the thing. Traditional data center. I build for Christmas. Meaning, I may have a million orders per minute over Christmas and 10,000 orders per day the rest of the time. So normally speaking, I have to be ready for the million orders per Christmas. So I overbuild my systems. Now by comparison on the cloud, I can buy what I need most of the time and scale by adding additional servers when needed. That's what makes the cloud so agile. That's what enables the cloud to do such great things for our customers. This is truly transformational. So on-demand enables that. On-demand instances are basically you turn them on and they run. You pay by the second. So I use a computer for 10 minutes. I pay for 10 minutes. I want to auto-scale. I auto-scale. This is great. Here's where this is great. If you don't know what your capacity is, this is the best because it's dynamic. Here's the problem. You pay by the second, which means if you're using a lot of these, it gets expensive. Why is it expensive? Because when the provider is charging you based on convenience, they're charging you convenience prices, which is why it's cheaper to go to the grocery store than it is to stop at the convenience store. Same thing. If you have time to shop around, you can get a better price. So on-demand is going to be the most expensive, but it's the most agile as well. The next type of Virtual machine or instance we're going to purchase is a reserved instance. This is great. For example, if you know you need 10 servers with 128 cores and 4 terabytes of DRAM, you reserve them ahead of time. You basically say, AWS, I am going to sign a contract for one year or three years and give me the best pricing because I'm willing to commit to it. And it's a good discount. So. On demand is most expensive because you don't know, and the cloud provider doesn't know, so they don't know what to invest in. Reserved instances, you tell your cloud provider, we're going to use these 10 servers at this capacity for the next two years or three years. You'll get a good discount for doing it because they can plan. They know that they can buy a $60,000 server because they're going to bill you $200,000 for that server, so it's easy to plan around. The next is something called the scheduled reserved instance. Let's say, for example, that you had a batch job that had to be run every weekend that's not tolerates downtime. 
and it's going to take 48 hours straight. You purchase additional compute instances called scheduled reserves and intents, and you schedule them Saturday and Sunday every single week. And there you go. Now, there are two other ways to go. The next one, which I almost never use, but they're part of a cost management strategy, is a spot instance. Here's what a spot instance is. There's always leftover capacity in AWS, and they auction off this capacity. So it's like basically saying, I'm willing to pay a dollar a minute for this capacity. And if the price is less than a dollar a minute, you win, and you can use those computers for a dollar a minute. Now, if the demand on the AWS environment goes up, and the price of the server goes up to a dollar and a penny a minute, you get kicked off because you're paying less. So spot instances are good if you need additional compute power, and if nothing gets done, it doesn't matter. But spot instances are preemptible. They can be shut off by the cloud provider. So don't use spot instances for anything that matters. Now, if you can craft your application that you can be turned on, paused, and shut off and still work, then spot instances are useful. But spot instances, you can be kicked off, which is not good. The last type of per way you can purchase is something called a dedicated host. Let's face it. There are things and times when you need to see what's going on with the server itself. Maybe the server, need, you need to have access to the CPU cores. Maybe you need to see true memory utilization. Maybe you need a specific MAC address. That's a dedicated host. Basically, you buying a server, a full server in the cloud. So let's talk about these options again. On demand, pay for what you need when you need it. Reserved. Reserve something, pre-commit to something, sign a contract. Schedule a reserve. Commit to something in a certain number of days per week and get a discount. Spot instance. Bid in an auction-like manner for extra capacity. Get super cheap prices, but... AWS feels like shutting you down because the price goes up, you're done. Not good. Dedicated host. You need complete and total control over the situation by a far server. You're basically buying a bare metal server from AWS. It would be the same kind of server with the same kind of performance you'd have in your own data center. Best performance, most expensive. So now you know how to purchase them. But let's really talk about what goes on in these servers. We'll call this Tennessee options because that's the AWS term. So generally speaking, you launch a virtual machine. It's sitting on a server somewhere. Most cases, when you do this, you're on a server, your competitors are on a server, somebody else is on a server. There's lots of people on the same server. That's shared tenancy. This is the default, meaning if you just buy an EC2 instance, from AWS, you're going to be on a shared server. And that's great for most people. Now, you might want a little more control. You might like to purchase a server, and you're the only customer on the server. That's called a dedicated instance. Shared tenancy is default. Dedicated instance is you buy a server, and all your stuff is sitting on that server. Now, sometimes you need actual better than that. Sometimes you need access to the physical server itself. This is where you buy a dedicated host. This is a bare metal server. This is like what you need where you install your own operating system. This is realistically speaking, if you need actual server, you know, software that's tied to a MAC address of the server, software that's tied to some physical card, a CPU socket, this is when you use a dedicated host. So dedicated host, bare metal server, a dedicated instance, dedicated server for you and all your virtual machines on there. Shared tenancy, you and everybody else are all on the same server. So let's talk a little bit about securing your virtual machines. So realistically speaking, the default security policy um, that you're talking about is to deny all traffic, which is great news. So the EC2 instance typically come with a security group, which is a lot like a host-based firewall that keeps traffic out of the security, out of the system. And being a firewall, guess what? Firewalls deny. Until proven otherwise, until you tell them otherwise. So when you set up the security groups, which keep unwanted traffic out of your instances, here's what you need to do. You need to do the following. You need to tell it what you want to allow in. Allow TCP port 443 for HTTPS. 
allow UDP port 69, for example, for a TFTP. Not that we're using TFTP anymore. So basically what's going on is you've got a source and a destination and a protocol and a port number. So that's the way you're going to set up your security groups. So here's what it's going to look like. And we'll go through how to really secure the cloud because how to secure the cloud and network ACL and a security group isn't even more than 10% of it. It's going to take a lot more to do an enterprise grade security. And that's okay. We love talking about security. We'll walk you through all of it. But look at the security group. So the security group is basically a host based firewall which keeps traffic out of your EC2 instance. Pre instance. So think about it this way keep unwanted traffic from entering your instance, and then on the instance itself, put a second host-based firewall, disable unnecessary services, add some anti-malware protection. This is how you necessarily do some things. This is how you how it works. So now let's talk a little bit about, you know, how we would give an IP address to our AC2 instances. So realistically speaking, if your computers are gonna be on a network, they need an address. Now the good news is, when you're dealing with AWS and you turn it on and turn it on, they use dynamic host configuration protocol to automatically assign you an IP address. And they also have something called EC2 DNS, which gives you that DNS name. Now, if you need a public address, you can get a public address that can be assigned to your EC2 instance called an elastic IP address. Why do you need a public address? You're connecting to external entities, external organizations or the internet by comparison. Private IP addresses are what you're gonna use inside of your network. They provide a level of security and profit that because they're not reachable from the internet. Not complete security, but it helps. And of course, you know, if you're dealing with IPv6, instances automatically get a, get a name, get an IP address. No, IPv6 does not have the concept of public and private addresses. So they're all gonna be public with IPv6. And if you're not using IPv6, turn it off. Don't have any way that you can be hacked that you're not actually using. So. How can you do this? They get an address via DHCP. How do you manage your systems? Well, you go to the management console. Uh, we showed you today. You can directly SSH into your systems. And if you're dealing with Windows, you can use Windows Remote Desktop. Now, you're not going to be working with many Windows servers because most servers are Linux, but you'll probably deal with Microsoft Active Directory. Um, and that, you know, you're going to be using Remote Desktop Protocol or using the console port that you will log into directly through the AWS environment. So I'm going to take a break here um, before we get to the next section. The next section we're going to talk about is databases. But before we get to databases, I want to make sure we answer the questions that are lingering between the last section. It looks like some came in. So Chris, um, if you want to pop up the questions, we'll do the best we can to answer them one at a time. Amir Saeed. Hi, Mike. Could you please let me know more about patching an us in a virtual machine? What would you like to know, Amir? Because patching an OS in a virtual machine is identical to the way you would actually do it in the data center. Of course, there are some ways to do it with AWS, some services that can help make it easier for you. But uh, patching an OS is the same. But generally, things um, that I like to see people do are as follows. I like to see people, when they boot up a system, come up with a boot scrap kit on, uh, what do you call it? On uh, on an Ubuntu system, it's a sudo app dash get install. On a Linux system, like a Red Hat version or, an, or a CentOS version, there's typically a yum install or yum install update or yum update that'll typically do it. But typically speaking, that's the way I would do it. I would patch everything consistently. And you know, I'm an architect, so I would design it. My cloud engineers build it and they give it to the sysops team. And those sysops people have very good tools for patch management. Chris, if you'd like to bring up the next one. Uh, we don't have any right now. Oh, really? So wow. I guess we can get them to type cloud hired in the chat box then. <laughs> okay. So you've heard from my chief operating officer, Chris, who keeps me online. If you're having some time, if you can type cloud hired in the chat box. Also, if you can leave a like, a comment, a share. Sharing is caring. Please uh, help us out with the algorithm. Zaki, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Head over heels is great info. Thank you so much. Allison, Cloud Hired. I love that. Leo, Cloud Hired. Wonderful. Eva, Cloud Hired. Thank you. Faisal, Cloud Hired. Awesome. I know you're here. Alonzo, my good friend and great cloud architect, Cloud Hired. Nick Love, wonderful. Jeremy Wright, fantastic. Allison, wonderful. 
Jesse Murdoch, Almode, Brenda, a wonderful, wonderful Shapur, Carlos, Mario Millen, Ransom, Peer Lincoln, Abigail. Love this group from all over the world. This is fantastic. Oh, head over heels. Um, Tansom, Yun Mag, um, Cedro, Derek. Oh, it was good to hear from you. Reginald, awesome. Amir, so nice to have you here. Jeannie, Cloud Hired, wonderful. Nick, Cloud Hired, wonderful. Joel, wonderful. Cloud Hired. Daniel, Green, Cloud Hired, love it. Rita, wonderful. Keelan, Mike, you're a great delivery. Thank you so much, Keelan. Kieran, uh, you're welcome. Theo, Cloud Hired. Alex Seaman, wonderful. Lightning441, Alex, wonderful. Chinton, wonderful. Mark Milley, Cloud Hired. Amir, so great to see you here. Uh, Mario, such nice things to say. Shake your farms, you're welcome. Um, I oh great um, Obina wow wonderful Aqua so great to see you all so we're having fun Obina thank you so we're all having fun then so this is really great so uh, let's see um, realistically speaking Allison thank you so much for your kind words there I'm very lucky to have the people I have on my team Amrath welcome okay now let's get into some. Uh, Ransom just found us today. Really appreciate the content. Come back, like, and subscribe, please. We'd love to keep you here. AWS versus, okay, so here's a question. AWS versus GCP versus Oracle. Real-time use cases for all three. Here's the thing. Do you like Ford, Chevy, or Mercedes? You choose one. Now, take it a little bit deeper. Each cloud provider has various strengths. Google's strength lies in their machine learning tools and algorithms. Um, they're all, they, but they all have good things. But you know, Google's strength lies there. AWS has some extraordinarily good infrastructure for high-performance computing. Azure is the most business-friendly, typically speaking, of the bunch, the most friendly regardless of your background. So there's all kinds. They, it's really based upon your needs, your likes, your relationships. So all of them do the same. Oracle does the same, the OpenStack Ansible Cloud does the same, the Nutanix Cloud does the same, it just doesn't matter. Cloud's a cloud. You're the architect, you determine what the customer needs, you go to the store that gives your customers the best price for the best product, that's what you choose. Just like you would in any other consulting. Difference between RDS and reuse cases, well, we're gonna talk a lot about that stuff starting now. I'm gonna cover that in the database section, so your timing is great. We haven't gone through the VPC course. No, we have not, Chintin. We're going to do that later. We did just a brief intro. Lenny, wonderful. David, wonderful. Lenny, fantastic. Okay. Let's talk about databases. So let's begin by what is a database? A database is an application that's going to allow for the storage of vast amounts of information. Now, how is a database different than just dumping it in a box somewhere? A database facilitates storing, calculating, reporting, and information sharing. So databases are really a critical component to modern applications. They are fantastic. And they give the business an extreme competitive advantage. Now, realistically, you've got three kinds of databases that we're going to talk about. And then we've got a big data environment called the data lake, which we'll address. The types of databases we're going to talk about are going to be relational databases, no SQL databases, and data warehousing databases. And it's important to know all about them, as well as the integration into something called a data lake. So let's talk about what is a relational database. A relational database provides access to related information. So why does an organization use a relational database? To learn the relationships between variables. So if I decrease the price by 20%, what does that drive to sales? If I raise the price, what does that do to sales? If I do this, what does it happen? When you're looking at related variables, you can identify the relationships between variables, which helps a business make better business decisions based upon better information. So databases, specifically relational databases, are really, really, really important. And uh, and, and enterprise computing. And basically, they provide storage, relational databases of data that's related to each other. So I'm not a database architect, I'm a cloud architect, but data is typically stored in a certain environment with spreadsheets and rows. 
It's like a spreadsheet with rows and columns. And that's the way relational databases store the relational database, a very fixed schema. Now, when you're dealing with AWS, they've got lots of relational databases that you can use. So for example, when you're dealing with relational databases, relational databases hit this what's called an ACID model. Um, and what I mean by that, when, when you talk about relational databases, they always talk about them following the ACID model. The ACID model is that they're atomic, meaning all or nothing. You either wrote or you didn't write. The transaction occurred or it didn't occur. Now, when you're dealing with relational databases, there's something called immediately consistent. What does this mean? The second I write to the database, everybody else gets the new write. But there's a cost to that. So transactions are all or nothing, meaning atomic. They're consistent, meaning the second I write, everybody else reads it, I update it, which is good. Next, transactions are isolated. One transaction has no impact on another, which is very important. And durable. Data in the database is not going to be lost. You need this. So what does this mean? All or nothing transactions. Okay, great. Immediately consistent. The second I write, it's readable. But think about that. What is the overhead of hitting a database and making it instantly available to all? A lot. So that consistency, that acid, the way these databases are designed, affects their scalability in a big way. By comparison, if they were eventually consistent, they could scale better. But realistically speaking, that's what we're talking about databases. Now, relational databases, you've got a lot of choices. Relational databases are a business critical, mission critical business application. And with Amazon, you get to choose most of them. Whether you're choosing Amazon Aurora, which is their own branded one, MariaDB, Microsoft SQL Server, MySQL, Oracle Database, Postgres SQL. I'm gonna just walk you through very rapidly um, and talk about Amazon Aurora. Amazon Aurora is the AWS branded, fully, ma fully managed relational database. And if you've been using MySQL, it's compatible, or Postgres MySQL is compatible. It's relatively high performance, and you know, according to AWS, their Aurora is up to five times faster than MySQL and three times faster than Postgres. What I can tell you is, they took a lot of the features, functionalities, and benefits of a commercial database, like an Oracle database, and they gave it to you without having to pay for it. So the cost is more like that of an open source database. It's a good database. Great for enterprise applications, software as a service applications. And that's the Amazon brand that then can be serverless, meaning you don't have to think about servers and storage. Now let's talk about one of the most common ones, MySQL, open source relational database. Of course, you can do that on AWS. Extremely popular. Now let's talk about Postgres just for a second. Postgres SQL is an open source relational database. It's got a very, very advanced feature set compared to MySQL, and it scales relatively well. Now let's talk about MariaDB. Of course, you can do that on the cloud too. Basically, it's an open source relational database made by the same people that made MySQL, but it has extra additional functionality enhancement. That's all. Now on the cloud, who else could you use? Um, you could use Microsoft SQL. And by using Microsoft SQL, you have access to SQL Server 2008, 2012, 2014. I think they just added a few new versions. Basically speaking, you can use the Express version, the web version, the standard version, and the enterprise version. And of course, you can use the Oracle databases, the standard, standard one, and enterprise. Oracle is probably the most popular if not one of the most popular relational databases in the world. Huge function set developed by Oracle, standard, standard one, enterprise, you know, these are the things you can do. Big, big, big database, lots of features and lots of functions. Every enterprise, lots of enterprises are using it, the Oracle database. And of course, you can do two versions. You can do the license included in which case you're just getting it from AWS and you're using their license and you can do the standard edition one and two. Or if you've already got an enterprise-wide license, you can bring your own license. And then you can use the standard version, the enterprise version, the standard edition one or two, and it's gonna use your own license. Um, 
Now let's talk about no SQL databases. No SQL or not only SQL is basically a database that's been designed for scalability. No SQL databases scale so nicely because what you're dealing with is a lot of flexibility, a lot of flexibility in the database scheme. No SQL databases are designed for structured and non-structured data. And since the structure is flexible, the NoSQL database can really, really scale. So NoSQL databases are predominantly key value pairs. You've got a key and a value, but not, not exclusively. Here's the thing with NoSQL databases. They are flexible. So you don't have to have the same row and column kind of schema that you would have in a relational database. Less structured data, so much more scalable. Now, there's lots of options you have with regards to NoSQL databases. You can obviously take a virtual machine and install Apache Cassandra or MongoDB. Guess what else you could do? You can use a fully managed Cassandra service called Keyspaces. You could use DynamoDB. So there are a lot of NoSQL databases you can use from. So, uh, Realistically speaking, so with AWS, the one that they like to pitch is DynamoDB. So the reason they like to pitch DynamoDB is it's their serverless, fully managed version. They also have key spaces. But again, there's MongoDB you can install on an EC2 instance. There's uh, Apache Cassandra. There's also key spaces. DynamoDB is this fully managed, highly scalable, serverless, meaning you don't have to think about the capacity of the ser server, the storage, um, when you're dealing with... Uh, DynamoDB, it's a fully managed NoSQL database. Here's the thing with NoSQL databases, it's got relatively low latency. Now there's also a cat, an in-memory cache you can attach to DynamoDB and the, and the in-memory cache will get you to sub millisecond latency. All data when you're dealing with this, uh, DynamoD is encrypted, it can be backed up. Now when you back these systems up, it doesn't even impact your performance. So the performance of this is really great. Let's talk a little bit more about NoSQL databases. NoSQL databases are designed realistically to work, you know, these are, are designed for, for real scalability. Now, when you're dealing with real scalability, what you're talking about is uh, the reason you can make these scale is you can partition the database. So when you partition the database, it makes it like a new database and the information is routed between so with DynamoDB, you create a secondary index. And when you're creating a secondary instance, it can be local or global. And the secondary index are going to have the same partition key as the base table. And these indexes can span across database partitions. So you can make some really big database transitions. Just remember, a key value can't exceed 10 gigs for the key value. Now, when you want to increase scalability, these are eventually consistent. Now, eventually consistent and immediately consistent are different and they have different business impacts. And because of being eventually consistent, but what you actually find is by doing it this way, they are much more scalable. So let's realistically talk about what we're talking about. So when we're talking about these databases and their scaling, we're realistically talking about something that's called the base model. And we're talking about the base model, we're talking about basically available, meaning there, but not necessarily completely available, softer state, and eventually consistent. So what do I mean by eventually consistent? If I write to the relational database, it's immediately available, instantly. If I write to a NoSQL database, I might write to it, and for a period of a second, people may get old data, and then a second later, they get new data. Now, by using this basic model, this base model versus that immediately consistent, we've allowed our scalabilities to grow so much more. So realistically speaking, those are the kind of things I want you to really think about. Now, we'll talk in a minute when you choose relational versus when you choose no SQL, but think about it this way. When you're dealing with DynamoDB, you provision the capacity ahead of time. You tell it how much you're going to need, and it's going to be available for you. Now, you can auto-scale up, but remember, with NoSQL database, specific DynamoDB, 
if you allow auto scaling up, it will scale up, but it won't scale down. So that's not necessarily the most efficient performance environment. You want systems to grow with you, but you want them to also reduce in size. So when you're dealing with DynamoDB, here's what you want to do. You want to do the following. You want to tell it your capacity needs. See, anytime you know ahead of time what your capacity needs are, you can reserve your instances, you can do better cost. So let's talk about relational databases versus NoSQL databases. Organizations want to find the relationship between variables. They use a relational database. Organizations want to look at more things that are extremely transactional, relational databases. Organizations need to have extreme scalability, like Internet of Things devices coming in. They use NoSQL databases. If you're dealing with huge shopping carts and inventory tracking, you're using a NoSQL database. So basically, your web apps are predominantly going to go with relational databases. Most things are going to go with relational databases, and you're going to use no SQL databases for the big stuff. So imagine a bank with its processing trades that does you know, 2 billion trades a day, no SQL database. Imagine your Netflix, for example, and you want to see where I left off. Wait, there was a show that my wife just found. It's called Never Have I Ever. It's kind of fun. We were watching it last night. I watched lots of TV, so it's the first time I saw it. So I'm watching Never Will I Ever. And we watched it for 22 minutes, and then I got tired. And when I go back tomorrow, it's going to remember exactly where I stopped. How's it going to remember that stored, that video state or that game state is stored in the NoSQL database? So when I, that's what they're doing with Netflix. They're storing my state there. So gameplay state, player game stores, leaderboards, all that stuff relation is NoSQL databases. So relational databases are used to find relationships between variables. No SQL databases are used for scalability and flexibility. Now we'll talk about the data warehouse real quick. And after we discuss the data warehousing database, we'll take some questions and then we'll move into data lakes, which are really cool and fun things. So let's talk about data warehousing. First, what is a data warehouse? You know, a data warehouse is a place where you store vast amounts of information. Why? Why does anybody care? If you collect the information and you analyze the information, you can probably make better business decisions. The better decisions you make, the better your business performs. So data businesses use data warehouses for this. Data warehouses are used for the following. You store the data. And typically what happens is you need a tool to store it, which is your, your, your data warehouse. You need a tool to prep and load the data, and you need a tool to visualize the data. So there's a lot of ways you can actually do this. I'm going to show you how to do this straight with AWS solutions. Typically speaking, you'll take your object storage. You'll use some kind of a glue or map reduction function. You'll pull information from Redshift and back and forth, and you'll visualize your data with QuickSight or Tabulo or something that's going to help you make better inferences based upon your data. That's why organizations use data warehouses. So the Amazon branded data warehouse is something called Redshift. It is uh, a fully managed AWS data warehouse. It enables you to gain actionable insights from your data, like I said, used for business analytics. Amazon Redshift Spectrum can provide some real-time insights into your business, especially when combined in services like S3. It's going to be fast, be Redshift, powerful, and fully managed. So it's going to be a big database. It's a petabyte scale data warehouse. It's based on Postgres SQL, so you can run SQL queries on it. Really great um, uh, data warehouse. The SQL queries thing really give you a lot. Now, when you're dealing with Amazon Redshift, for example, you're realistically building around computer. You basically have got two kind of nodes. You've got leader nodes and compute nodes. The way the architecture work is you've got a primary node called the leader node, and you've got compute nodes that support leader nodes but the queries and everything is directed to the later node. So let's talk about scaling these things. You've got two types. You've got dense compute and dense storage. When you're dealing with AWS, dense compute uses high-speed SSD because you can need high performance. Dense storage, many of it, high storage. High storage means magnetic, so dense storage uses magnetic arrays. So let's talk a little bit. And then we'll talk about how to optimize the databases, how to scale the databases, how to grow them, how to use them. We're going to get on all the things. But I just want to at least talk about what are these databases. 
before we move on, are there any questions about the relational databases or the data warehouse or the NoSQL databases of, of a high level what they are? And we're going to get into more depth about how to configure them and use them later. There are quite a few questions. OK, well, then let's already let's, <laughs> let's take some one by one. All right, give me just a second. And some you, some you may have already answered through the natural progress of the course. So I just I think know. we did. We answered Jawad's, but I'll answer it again. Uh, no SQL database is used when you need extreme scalability and performance. That's just like financial tracking, Internet of Things devices. Relational databases are used to track related information. Like, you know, if I make a sale of 20%, does it bump up sales? No SQL databases are much more scalable, but they have a lot more flexibility in the schema. Relational databases really give you that information on related variables in a great way. Chris, can bring up the next one. This may not be the appropriate place. I'm not sure. Learning is fun. When we cover the uh, security section, we will cover all of the firewalls, all the IDS IPS systems, network access control lists, security groups, host-based firewalls, and everything, everything that really matters. Hello, Mike. Can you explain the ACID model? I um, think we kind of did, um, but you know what? We can do it again. The ACID model is that transactions are atomic, meaning they occur or they don't occur. They're consistent, which means the second I write to the database, it's immediately there for everybody else. Transactions are isolated from each other, meaning that um, one a transaction will not affect another. And transactions are what's called durable, meaning once they're actually inside there, um, they don't change. Chris, uh, what's the next one? Uh, sorry, people responding to, uh, okay, here we go. Do we have the same policies for RDS, such as autoscan, query, UI control, how to, every one of these databases mode is going to be slightly different, and each one is going to have different features and functions, so your mileage is going to vary based upon the database that you choose. Uh, and there was a question about if the labs are in the book. Yes, the labs yeah, are in uh, the book. <laughs> the Certified Solution Architect Associate book is full of labs. Our Certified Solution Architect Professional book is not full of labs because that's more geared towards the architect. But the associate was geared to beginner's thing. You could be coming at it from a cloud engineer, cloud architect, so we have labs there. There we go. Okay. Okay, Mario, we're going to get there. Once we talk about database optimizations, we'll talk about having your databases in two availability zones. We'll talk about scaling databases with caching, queuing, and read replicas. So, Mario, that's coming today. I don't know what you mean by Aurora Global Master, Arun. Um, so, because it's only part of a sentence. Io, what schema? The way you structure the, lay the layout of the data in the database is related to the schema. Um, definitely something that uh, all database people definitely need to use, um, need to spend some time on. But unless you're a database architect, the good news is, like, if you're a cloud architect like me, you won't be doing any work on databases, but you still need to know how to, how to design them. Arun, where do you use Aurora Global Database and Master Table? I got to tell you, I have never used Aurora for the following reason. I don't do serverless in most cases. So I like to have a database that people can take on the cloud and off the cloud at a moment's notice. So I typically use much different kinds of databases with my clients. I choose, I cho the, it's very challenging to get your data on and off of a client. So most of the clients that I demand with are big global businesses that will spend a billion dollars on tech, and they will never, ever use a service that makes it hard for them to go to one cloud provider to another cloud provider. So in my world of multi-cloud networking and hybrid clouds and big cloud architectures, Aurora is not something we use. Aurora is an excellent database. Excellent. But my clients would be more likely to use a MongoDB or a Cassandra DB for no SQL purposes. My clients, the kind of big clients I work with, would be more likely to use an Oracle relational database and be willing to pay for it 
because they want to be able to go on the cloud, off the cloud, from one cloud to another. So I don't know that on Aurora because I don't do serverless for those reasons. Very hard to come on and off. Now, I think serverless is cool. But remember, serverless is vendor lock-in, meaning once you go serverless, you can't get out. So if an organization were to spend $100 million refactoring the code to go to AWS and it doesn't work, it's going to cost them a fortune to go to Azure. And then if they don't like Azure, it's going to cost them a fortune to go to Google and it'll cost them a fortune to go back. So for right now, you know, the, I'm not working with any of those. I'm working with the big enterprise things or the same ones from the data center. They're being migrated to the cloud. What is the relationship between MongoDB and RDS? MongoDB is one of the very good NoSQL databases. So typically speaking, you're thinking of Apache Cassandra, MongoDB, and these are used everywhere. So MongoDB is, would be used where in the same cases you would actually use DynamoDB, whereas RDS are relational databases or something you use anytime you need a relational database such as Oracle, MySQL, um, MariaDB, that kind of thing. Farad, Faisal, how much no knowledge do you need about databases? Some. Here's the thing. You know, it depends on the kind of architect you are. So if you're a cloud big data, a cloud architect that focuses on big data, you're going to need to be an expert on databases. And I work with a lot of people. They've been database administrators, database architects for decades. Now we teach them the cloud, and they focus cloud and database. Someone like me focuses predominantly on cloud infrastructure. So I'll never touch a database. People come to me for cloud networking. Other people do cloud security that will never touch the database. But I will say this. Fundamental knowledge for all cloud architects are everything that's in the network in the data center, which means routers, switches, firewalls, servers, containers, load balancers, IDS, IPS systems, and uh, just, to, just to name a few, um, NAT, VLANs, dot one q tagging, q and q tagging, Ethernet over MPLS, BGP everywhere, interior gateway protocols. This is all critical knowledge. <laughs> knowledge of server, social virtualization, knowledge of databases, at least what they do and which one to choose for different things to be there. And then go ask a database architect. So, you know, Active Directory, there's just so many things to learn. You can't learn everything and you can't be great at everything. So you've got to be great at what you choose to do. So pick your one thing and that's where you need to know. Um, what are database streams? We'll talk about streaming data maybe, um, but in this program, that's more of the certified solution architect professional, but what streaming data is, you can have a lot of coming data in and you can actually analyze it in real time. As an architect, is it your job to determine the kind of database that best fits your client? Yes. So as an architect, you're going to do one of two things. If you're a generic cloud architect, you're going to go find a database architect that's going to be an expert that's going to help them make a decision. As, as a rule, if you're if you're a big data per architect, you might be consulting the cloud architect on how to do it best. But you definitely should know what kind of databases to use, at least minimum. When to use relational, when to use NoSQL, when to use a data warehouse, how to create a data lake. You need to know that. You must know it. Manesh, how do you achieve database and activity monitoring? Um, that's a question for a sysops professional. I'm an architect. I don't do any kind of monitoring or maintenance. Um, so I can't get, honestly answer that question with good, in, with good insight. I'm an architect that's not part of architecture, so I don't want to give you incorrect information. How do you connect DynamoDB with Elasticsearch? Um, I can get you the configuration commands from the AWS website. It's very easy to do. Again, I'm an architect. I don't do configuration. But uh, there's some great information on um, how to actually use Elasticsearch with DynamoDB. I am happy to search the configuration manual and post it in the chat box for you. Chris is our, okay, so. Here's where I would get started on that. It's an old document, but I would typically get started from that. But, you know, 
I would get started here. To let you know, when I configure, which is not often because I'm an architect, I always, 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 even if it's something I've done a thousand times, always go to the manufacturer's documentation. And here is the reason why. It changes constantly. So because it changes constantly, I want to be up to date because I don't like to make mistakes. So that's what I do. So I always, always, always look it up. But I am not Mr. Configure because I've been an architect for a long time. Now, I'll tell you this. When I was an engineer 25 years ago, I configured things all the time and I remembered how to do it. But about 24 years ago, 23 years ago, I became an architect and that was the end of my configuration, as is all the architects. What happens is as you move up the architect ranks, your skills, which are really design skills, become design skills, presentation skills, emotional intelligence skills, executive presence skills, sales skills. And you'll see a shift from the how to do it to what benefits does it provide the company? And that's the big architecture piece. So. Um, what I'm going to say is I'm going to go talk about, you know, how do we optimize some of these databases specifically? Um, and then we'll have some fun with that today. We'll talk about optimizing databases. And then that should probably be where we go today. So what we'll do next is I'll briefly speak about data lakes for about a minute or two. After we talk about the database, we'll talk about how to scale these things. We'll have the fun with read replicas and caching and queuing. It's going to be a ball. So um, before I do this, my team has asked me to say, if you're enjoying this content, please leave a like, hit the like button, and please let me know that you're having fun, you're here, and I can hear you by typing hashtag cloud hired, and then I know you're here. So we like to know you're here. We like to know that people are paying attention to the work we're doing. It's a lot of work to put these together. We do it for you, so we like to know that you're here. So if you can please hit the like button, share with friends, as well as do the following, hit hashtag cloud hired. Okay, now, while you guys are doing that because there's a 60 second delay, I'm pretty sure. Um, we're not in the same time place by about 60 seconds. Let's talk about data lakes. What is a data lake? A data lake is a repository where you can store structured data and unstructured data in the same place at a huge scale. So a data lake is where you're going to put huge amounts of raw data. You know what's so cool about data lakes is you don't have to structure it right now. You can stick your data here and use it later. So why are organizations building data lakes? Organizations are building data lakes for the following reasons. It enables them to store large amounts of data. It's adaptable. It's changeable. You can keep all your data in its native format until it's needed. So this is some pretty cool stuff. Data lakes hold information. You can query and search for relevant information. Here's why data lakes are so awesome. They're awesome for the following reasons. We can take all these data sources, all of our different kinds of databases that each do things. Remember, data warehouses hold vast amounts of information for business intelligence. No SQL databases store vast amounts of information with flexible schema. Relational databases show us things that are related to each other. We may have some object storage. We've got all kinds of stuff. So what we do is use these ETL tools and these map and reduce tools, and we aggregate our data into a single source. And then we can run some machine learning applications, some AI applications, and make better decisions. So the whole point of building all these databases and data lakes is to do something with the data. You know, I ask and ask new people, why a data lake? And they're like, I don't know. I'm like, why a database? And they're like, to store stuff. I'm like, but why? See, when you're thinking about things from an architecture perspective, I want you to really remember this. Nobody except for us likes technology. Businesses hate it. Technology is this expensive thing that forces them to need expensive people. Why do organizations use technology? Because it gives them a business benefit. So help them with that business benefit, help them create a great data architecture and help them act on that data to make better decisions. That's what we architects do. We help organizations use technology to become better businesses. So let's talk about some optimizations. We're gonna talk about how to scale things. 
And uh, it's a lot of content we're going to talk about, but I figure we can do it in about 30 minutes. And that way we can stay on track. So let's do this. Let's talk about database optimizations. When you're dealing with AWS, there's a couple of optimizations that you can actually have. So let's talk about these optimizations. We'll talk about backups. We'll talk about automated backups. We're going to talk about snapshots. We're going to talk about encryption. We're going to talk about scalability. We're going to talk about read replicas, caching, and queuing. And of course, high availability. So let's do this. Let's talk about backing up relational data, backing up your databases. Now, one thing I will tell you is AWS has a fantastic database backup environment. They do automated backups automatically. And this isn't just backing up your data in the database. It backs up everything, your entire drive. So think about it this way. You do a backup of your database. If anything happens with your database, your backup is a machine image. You can just launch that database as a new instance with a new IP address. And in seconds, your whole database is up. So these database backups are awesome. AWS, extremely good database backup strategy. Really great. So your backups that get done can be retained from one day to 35 days. Backups happen in a specified window each day. Now, one thing to remember with your relational databases in AWS and your database backups, except for DynamoDB, is that when the systems are backing up, for a short period of time, they may be unavailable or they'll be performance be seriously degraded. So just remember that. Here's what it looks like. Here's what a database backup looks like. You create a database snapshot. It takes your system and it makes a complete image of it. Now there's the automated backups, but you can do a manual snapshot. The snapshot is literally every component of the hard drive. So again, you can just launch it in a second. And these DB snapshots, the manual ones you make, are there until you need them. So you're making this kind of snapshot, which is really cool. Now let's talk about putting it back together. You have your snapshot, everything's good. You, you want to restore your database, it's pretty simple. All you do is as follows. You take your image, you create a new instance. New instance has a new IP address, which means a new DNS name. You change whatever that is in your mapping, and you are up and running that fast and that easy. That's why we love um, restoring databases, and we love the AWS data backup, database backup approach. It's fantastic. Some of the best I've ever seen. So now let's talk about encryption. If you're going to store your data on a database, if you're going to store your data in public, if you're going to store your data anywhere, encrypt it. What happens if somebody steals the hard drives out of AWS systems? Do you want them having access to your information? I don't want to have access to my information, so encrypt it. So what happens is here's what you do. When you want to do encryption in AWS, you enable the key management service. So basically, you encrypt the entire EBS lamp. And of course, you know, the key management system is a managed service helping you with your controlling your keys, but enable the key management system and it will encrypt your EBS volumes and your databases are all stored on EBS volumes. Now there are other forms of encryption you could also use. You can use transparent data encryption, which is if you're working with like Microsoft SQL and Oracle databases, they use a different kind of encryption. They encrypt and decrypt on the fly. So, you basically could use transparent data encryption with the cloud HSM security module. So basically, when you pull your data, it'll be decrypted. When you store your data, it'll be encrypted. So it'll be encrypted on the fly the whole time. Pretty kind of great way. And of course, you can use encryption in transit, which is like SSL between the destination. So encrypt the volume, encrypt it along the way, just keep it encrypted, and you'll be in great shape. If you're going to use SSL TLS, it's going to use certificates, just like any other web application. Now let's talk about scaling databases. Databases are an incredibly mission critical application for businesses. So there's two ways you can scale them and I want you to really think them all. Generally speaking, here's what scaling up means. You're on a server that's got eight cores and a terabyte of RAM. You move to a server that's got 16 cores and two terabytes of RAM. Then you move to a server that's got 128 cores and four terabytes of RAM. And at some point, no matter what you do, you're going to run out of CPU overhead. So add more computers. Now, it's not like with databases that you can just use a load balancer. I wish it was, but you can. Da scaling databases is it's, it's kind of its own level of magic in there. And we'll talk about what that magic is. It's not that hard. But you just don't add computers in a load balancer. 
So here's what you're going to do. You're going to scale up the size of the server to something big, and then you're going to add more servers. So you just, because remember, you can only scale up to a certain size, and you can only scale out by adding additional instances, a certain number in databases. So you got to get really careful here. So let's talk about, you know, how do you scale them? If you're dealing with a NoSQL database, like Apache Cassandra, MongoDB, DynamoDB, Keyspaces, it's easy. You just partition it. And the partitioning this database chops in into partitions and the application of the intelligence to route between participations, partitions, and this is real efficient. Simple, 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 and elegant on NoSQL. But now, let's pretend it's not NoSQL. Let's pretend it's a relational database. So what we're going to do here is we're going to talk about how to do it. And then together, we're going to have a like whiteboarding lab session. We're going to work it all together because I'm going to make sure you guys all know this. So how do we scale out? Well, what we do is we add something called read replicas. And what is a read replica? Basically, and this works for pretty much everybody other than MariaDB, where it's an, a read-only copy. So you've got a master database, and you've got read replicas. Read replicas are read-only versions of the master database. So what happens is as follows. You create these read replicas, and you point your users to the read replica. So all the reading work or the query work goes to the read replica. So let's look at what it looks like architecturally. In this environment, we've got a basic three-tier web app all in a single availability zone. So we've got a web server, an app server, and a database server. Now this is our master database. Now we also have two read replicas. And the reason we're using read replicas is we're gonna point all read traffic to the read replicas. So if we didn't have the read replicas, all the read and write traffic would go to the main database. But if we've got a lot of read traffic, if we point them to the read replicas, which are other systems, the, the CPU on the main database server won't have to deal with read traffic, only write traffic. So we can reduce load by adding up to four read replicas. So four times the read activity than the write activity. So when do you use read replicas? You use read replicas when there's a lot of read activity. So if all your activity is write and no reading, and you added read replicas, it's not going to help because nobody's reading. So for you, the architect, you have to know what you're doing, and that's what you find. So if there's lots of read activity, add a read replica. When the read activity or the querying is slowing things down, add a read replica. When you need more capacity, you can't add an additional master database, add a read replica. So read replicas are for performance, not disaster recovery. They do not help with disaster recovery. They help with performance. Now, what else? Now, we keep talking about these caching kind of ideas. What is caching? It's a place to keep your systems from being used. So look at it this way. If we had a cache that stored frequently accessed queries, prior, so if we have a cache here and a read replica here, what will happen is the first time someone queries, the read it hits the read replica, the information gets stored in the cache and it gets sent to the person. The next person that hits the cache for the same query gets information. So now the queries are being answered by the cache instead of the read replica, which is being used instead of the actual master server. So see what you can truly do is you basically offload the read activity with read, with read replicas and you reduce the load on the read replicas with caching. So what happens, you put that in memory cache. And this is like content delivery networks where we talked about caching. This is where, like today, where we talked to volume gateway cache mode where we were caching. It's the same thing. Basically speaking, you set up a cache and you use the cache to offload frequent need from the read replicas and you offload the read, re read, read traffic. You put it on the read replica instead of the master database and now your systems can scale much more. But we're still gonna do more. So when you're dealing with caching, there's basically two main caches in the world. There's typically memcached and Redis. So of course, within your AWS, you still have Memcached and Redis, but now they're called Elasticache for Redis and Elasticache Memcached. So Elasticache for Redis is a really good, big feature set cache. And you know this is used all over this a big, big, powerful, fully functioned cache. So if you're using Redis workloads, you can just move them straight to Elasticache. 
Now, if you need a simple, basic, easy to play cache, you can use Memcached. Elastic Cache from Memcached is designed for simplicity, very easy to use. What is this caching doing? It's offloading work to the read replicas. So it's going to lower the disk, CPU, and I.O. requirements of the master database, reduces latency. So now let's look at it. Let's look what we have here. Same three tier web app, web app database. Note, we're using the cache to reduce the load on the database. Now, if caching reduces the load on the lead architect and queuing is the next phase. So look at it this way. So we take all the read load off. Uh, we reduce the read load with read replicas. We then add um, a cache to the read replicas to further reduce the load and then we reduce the write load by only sending information to the database when the database is ready for it. Let's say you had a million people lining up in your front door. How many people can fit into your house? 30, 40, 100, 200, 300, and you're done? So here's what a queue would do. You open the door to your front house. One person's allowed in. One person leaves the back door. The next person enters the house, the next one. 10 people leave the back door. You allow 10 more into the front door. So you can smooth who's coming in, and that's what queuing does. Queuing enables you to schedule a delivery. So let's put the pieces together. Here's what queue. Let's say you want to go to the database. You send a message that sticks in the queue, which is a temporary store for the messages. The messages get taken out of the queue and sent to the receiver when the receiver is ready. That's what we're talking about, queuing. So the sender sends it to the queue. The queue stores it for up to two weeks, and the queue gives it to the receiver when the receiver is ready, and the receiver takes it out of the queue. So when we're talking about AWS, they've got some pre-made killing systems. So what are we talking about? There's something called SQS and the simple killing system. We'll talk about it much, much, much more when we do about the AWS services, but we're gonna do a little bit right now. You've got two options. Standard comes in as fast as those packets go in or messages go in, they leave the queue. Fast, 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 no guarantee of order. Now, by comparison, if we want to guarantee the order, we can do something first in, first out, or FIFO. Message one goes before message two, goes before message three, and before message four. Now, remember this. If you do this, message two may take a lot longer than the next three to ten. So when you do a first in, first out queue, it will slow it down. So this is what your environment is going to look like without a queuing in a normal environment. Your CPUs, your disk is going to be like this. It's going to be doing nothing, almost pegged at max almost nothing, pegged at max, and then it's going to be all over the place. With queuing, what you can see is it's going to be smooth, kind of like letting the front door and the back door of your house, you know, be in one of these kind of situations. So that's realistically speaking what we're talking about. Now, I want to do the following. I want to do this. I want to walk you through the example of building it out in about two minutes. But I just want to talk about two things before we do that. I want to, actually, you know what? I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm going to stop right over here. We're going to do a whiteboarding session. And then tomorrow we'll do a little bit of databases. We'll do some high availability database designs and then we'll have fun. We'll start getting into some networking and things. So let's do this. Let's, uh, let's you know, brainstorm right now and let's walk it through. I'll, I'll, I'll make a highly scalable database with you. Let's build our database time together. So let's say we've got a database. Let's call this our master database. My SQL master DB. Okay, now here's my database. It's on a 128 core server. It's got four terabytes of DRAM and it's busy. CPUs at 75%, disk is busy. I need to offload this thing. How do I offload this? What do I add? Type in the chat box to reduce the read load off of my servers. Someone from the group, tell me what I do to reduce the read load. What special kind of server can I add so that I can direct all my queries for read 
Yun Mag, you got it, a read replica. Excellent, Yun Mag. So we're gonna take, we're gonna add some read replicas. Um, so, wow, Jeremy got it, Chinton got it. Okay, fantastic. Jeremy, you guys are doing great. We're gonna add some read replicas. Let's do that. MySQL RR. Let's copy this. Got a couple of these things. Okay, so we added some read replicas. And we can we can add up to four. So let's say we're doing this. We're having fun. Read replicas all the way. How do we reduce the row the read load on the read replicas? What can we do to reduce the workload on the read replicas? How do we make sure that frequently accessed information doesn't have to keep going to the same read replicas? Mode, exact. We're going to use the cache. So we're either going to use memcached D or Redis. We're going to set up a cache, Daniel Green, exactly. A cache Sam should exactly. A cache Leo, a cache head over heels. Excellent, excellent, excellent. We're going to add up a cache because we've already set up our read replica. So let's add the caching. So let's add some cool elastic cache layer over here. I'm going to speed it up. Let's say. Okay, so all this stuff over here that we're doing, all this stuff in this little box is desired, which didn't come out well. Well, these My MySQL read replicas and the class to cut. Guess what? Now we've reduced the read load. Now, how do we smooth the write traffic going into this? What do we do to smooth the write traffic going into our server? How do we, where's this place? Because we don't want to lose messages on the way into the server. How do we store the messages so we don't lose them? We add a queue. And if we're dealing with AWS, they've got a pre-made queue called SQS which is gonna be super, super, super easy. So we'll add an SQS queue. Okay, so now let's look at the flow. The SQS queue is going to smooth the write traffic going in to the master database. The, the MySQL master database will be sending information to the read replicas. They'll keep be synchronized. So all read traffic is going to go to the read replicas. Then we're going to make sure that the read replicas don't have to work so hard because frequently accessed content is all going to go to the cache. So now you see what we've done is we've decoupled our architecture and we really, really, really helped it scale by decoupling everything. So I'm not hey, sure what's going hey on Mike? with this. Yes. Um, we have a quick question. I'm going to pop on the screen for you. Okay. Can a pub sub be used instead of a queue for this person? So pub sub is typically used in messaging and it would work perfectly for this environment, but most people use a queue to actually go into a database, but it's the same concept. But pub sub is typically used more for messaging, like a notification service where queuing is used for message storage. Were there any other questions? Um, there were a couple before you started the whiteboard. Okay, well, um, we started answering questions. Let's answer the last two. The last few. Yeah, I, I only brought that one up because it was specifically to the to the whiteboard. Um, okay, here we go. Okay. 
Brenda, which is better, SQS or SNS? It's not which is better, it's which is more appropriate for use at the time. So SNS would be used if you wanted to notify a tremendous number of people, for example, about something. So you would use an SNS notification basically to send an email. You would use an SNS notification to send an alert to systems administrators that basically would say, hey, by the way, your system CPU is 85%, go do something about it. So SQS is used for message stores. Um, SNS or simple notification is used for notifications, totally different use case. And right now you are live streaming and will it be available on this channel right away when the live is over? Absolutely. And what is the process and what kind of database is used? I don't know what you mean by what is the process and what kind of database he, is used. He's, he's asking what does YouTube use for your live stream and the recording? Do you I don't, any idea I don't, there? I don't know what YouTube actually uses. They're not going to publish the inner workings of their channel. Um, it is never in anybody's best interest to publish how their systems work because when they do, they get hacked. So um, a little bit of mystery is also, also, also you, very good when you have some security by obscurity in your systems. Faisal G, can I explain a content delivery network? The answer is I absolutely can. Um, we did talk about it fairly heavily yesterday. Um, and I'm happy to answer that as the last question, but let's see, let's ask the questions first that are from today and then I'll happily better use this. Um, Lightning DD1, we don't have a choice. We can't use SNS for this because SNS while used to fan out messages is not used to deliver messages to databases. So we don't have, SNS would not be used in this use case. SNS would be used to notify a system admin of something, not to put a message in a database. SQS is standard. Standard is in and out as first as possible, as Alonzo said, um, and FIFO is first in and first out, which is a selectable option, but it lowers performance. Exactly, internal network diagrams is a hacker's dream. Knowing of the operating system your people are using is a hacker's dream. Knowing the architecture of your environment, the IP addresses are all hacker's dream. Will queuing be as fast as if you write directly to the database? Will it add latency? The answer is yes. Having said that, if you don't use queuing, what will happen in a big database? Messages will be lost. And you, companies will lose orders. They will lose status as things. And the actual slowing down of the write transaction just enough to smooth it out might is better. And not only that, when the CPUs of a database gets to 100%, it's going to slow it down anyway. So adding a, a queue is, generally speaking, the fastest and best thing to do. The queue will not be used, um, effectively speaking, if there's no traffic. It'll just go in and out as fast as possible. So the queue's only there protecting you when you have problems. Um, that was, uh, those are all the ones related to the uh, OK, so those are related content. to the content, the content of today's class. Yesterday, there were some questions about we covered content delivery networks extensively. Um, I'm happy to go through a content delivery network and the way it works relatively quickly for those that desire. But I want to make sure, you know, for the folks that I mean, we covered it yesterday, so I'm going to do it right now because I always like to answer questions. So I'm going to ask if everyone that's been here, if they can leave a like, a comment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell. I'll ask if everyone that's here to type to, to let me know if you've had a good time today in the chat box. If you've had a really good time, type Cloud Hired because we're going to have a lot more fun today. And uh, please do like, comment, and share. Now, for the question on what is a content delivery network, we'll talk about a content delivery network, and I'll show you what it's going to look like in action right here, right now, because we love answering questions around here. So let me just do this. I will take my picture, try and move around a little bit for you. So here's what a content delivery network does. For those of you that don't know, what happens is traditionally internet traffic is best effort, meaning I send data to someone and hopefully it gets there, but there's no guarantee your net data gets there on, 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 uh, on the internet. So what a content delivery network does is it enables the user, so let's say you've got a user over here, to enter a private location and then ride a private network, not the internet, back to the provider source. By doing this, we're not dealing with internet connectivity speeds. We're dealing with private network, private network connectivity speeds, which means greater throughput and lower latency because you actually own the network. So this is really exciting stuff. So greater throughput, lower latency. Content delivery networks also have a caching service. 
And because they have a caching service, they speed content and reduce load. So here's the way a content delivery network is going to work. Here's me. I'm user, the blue user up top that looks like a square. I want to go to the www.gocloudcareers.com website. So I'm here sitting in Palm Beach. My website say hosted in San Francisco. The first thing that I do is I, I go and type www.gocloudcareers.com. Now my DNS resolves it and it gives me the content delivery networks location, which in my case is Miami because it's closest. So I go to the Miami content delivery network. And while I'm here in the Miami content delivery network, here's what's going to happen. If someone requested the same website before me, I'll hit the Miami Content Delivery Network location and it'll be immediately sent to me. If by comparison, I hit the Content Delivery Network cache and no one's requested it before that day, for example, I'll, my message request will hit the edge location. It'll ride the private backbone all the way back to the source and then it will be sent back to the regional cache, to the edge location cache, and then the data will be sent to me. Now, 10 minutes later, my wife is over here. My wife wants to go to go to the Go Cloud Careers webpage. She hits the same Miami edge cloud location, cloud front edge location. And the Miami Cloud Front Edge location has the website, so it sends it directly back to her. Now, Chris, who's on my team, is also in Florida. He hits the Cloud Front Content Delivery Network and the information sent back to him. So what a content delivery network does is as follows. It caches your information. So it takes information you've requested before and it sends it back to you, which we really love. The next thing the Content Delivery Network does is it enables you to provide, pri pri ride the private background. And because you pr ride the private network backbone as opposed to, uh, what do you call it? Um, if you ride the private backbone as opposed to the public internet, your data is going to be faster. So Content Delivery Networks speed your content to international locations. They provide caching queuing, and high-performance networking services. So I hope I answered your question on content delivery networks. We'll discuss it much more when we talk about CloudFront, and we will definitely discuss CloudFront in some depth because content delivery networks are super important. But you asked a question, and I wanted to make sure we at least answered your question. We covered it a lot more yesterday, a little bit today, and we will cover it very, very, very heavily. Before I close down for the day, um, is there anything I should, uh, any more, last questions for me? Um, there are, there's some questions that aren't related to the content. If you wanted to, uh, look, take well, a look at them. I'll, I'll, I'll do the best I can to ask the, answer the questions. I always like to try and leave people satisfied. Okay. Give me just a second to find them. Sure. Uh, as I'm finding them, I'm just going to be clicking these and bringing them on screen. So that you can. Uh, well, how do you hear that, Allison? Okay, here we go. Oh, uh, hold on. Um, there's the first part to that that I. <laughs> there's so many cloud hires I have to get through. <laughs> uh, okay, here we go. First part to that question that I just popped up. It'll make more sense now. Here's the first part. Let me go back. Well, to U.S. standard re resemble out of order data. Well, you know, Derek, it's a good question. Here's the second part, also. If you require the data to stay in order, Derek, you must, must, must use a FIFO queue. If it doesn't matter, then I would tell you that uh, the best thing to use is as fast as possible. Um, typically speaking, this isn't an issue. Doreen, thank you so much. Allison, thank you so much. Again, thank you, Allison. Sean, for you're just starting. Wonderful. Pierre Lincoln, today's been a, okay. Thank you. Cloud Genie, wonderful. Pierre, wonderful. Uh, there we go. There's a question. If your educational is site and down to huge traffic, what should you do in AWS? I don't really understand the correlation, meaning if you're going to a university and they're down, what you should do with AWS? Do um, you mean in terms of practicing or getting expertise or experience if, you're, if you're, your university is closed? I'm not really sure what you mean. So I don't know how to answer that.
You know, this is the most embarrassing Abigail question that I could actually answer. You know, normally speaking, I read three books a week. In the last six weeks, my life has been so busy that I've been literally answering phone calls from six o'clock in the morning to midnight, seven days a week. I've had about an hour to myself each day, and I've spent that hour with practicing Ashtanga Yoga. So I haven't read anything in the last six weeks, although I typically read two to three books a week. The books that I choose to read are typically as follows. I do a lot of reading with regards to behavioral science because the work that we do, I'm always constantly teaching psychology and sociology based things to give my students an unfair competitive advantage when they interview to make sure they can relate better to the clients. I'm always reading something on emotional intelligence. I'm always reading something on communication skills. I read every day the newest releases that are coming out from every major cloud provider. And the good news for most part is they're all the same old 30 year old technology with a new name. So that's pretty easy to stay in track of in most cases. I also once a, once a week or two, I collaborate with executives across all major tech companies to make sure that I stay current and up to date. And I do that for my friends as well. But other than that, for the last six weeks, I haven't had the chance to read literally anything. All I've done was design content, created content. The last two weekends, I was locked in a room creating an interview course to take people to make sure they get hired. Um, we Three weekends ago, we refilmed our six month old or less cloud architect career development program because I was unhappy that our six month old videos were too old. So we made about 200 hours of content recording and things that we did just a few weeks ago. So normally speaking, I always have a technical book. I always have a leadership book and I always have some kind of behavioral science book per week. But the last six weeks, I've been a bad bear. I want to say you're you're off on your six weeks by about six months. <laughs> and just, on, know, on, on, on three books a week. Okay, you might, have been, you might have been reading one or one, one or two a week. Yeah, but, I, but you, I would I would believe that you have not read three books a week for six months. Honestly, in the last six months, I don't remember what happened. It's been so busy and fun. Exactly. Here's a uh, here's another question. Here we go. Okay, now. No, Wakas Ahmad. This is a interesting one. How will a content um, delivery network work for a website having multiple data? This is where you're going to have to get really careful. This is where you're going to only push your static content over a CDN and your dynamic content, and you're going to have the very, very um, fast cache timeouts. Um, dynamic websites and CDNs may or may not be the best option in your situation. Seriously, you may need a whole lot more capacity. Okay, this is a great one. What's the difference between a data lake and a data warehouse? A data warehouse is a type of database, typically something like Postgres. It's full, full, full of a tremendous amount of things to store things. Where a data lake is basically you take the data from your relational database, you use a tool like Apache's, use like a Python Spark script, you pull it out, you create a landing zone, you pull your data out of your relational databases, your NoSQL databases, your data warehouses, you create it into an object storage landing zone. Then you take the object storage landing zone, you clean it up and, and modify it more, you create a data lake, and then you use some machine learning tools on your data lake, and then you basically visualize it so you can make better decisions. So a data lake is typically when you combine relational database, data warehouse, NoSQL database, and object storage, all to integrate into really big data solutions. Uh, you're more than welcome, I'm so happy we're here. My team and I are great. Thank you so much. Um, great lecture. Thank you. Martin, always great connecting with you. Daniel, thank you so much. Abigail, Big Gates Energy, thank you. You know, I probably need need a cup of coffee. I'm getting tired. Um, thank you, Michael, learning a lot. Um, Manesh, thank you. Great passion for teaching. I love teaching, and we'll definitely keep doing it. Doreen, do we have sessions this weekend? We will have sessions this weekend if we don't finish before Friday because we will not finish until I know that every one of you got a very good, high quality, you know, best in class and completely free AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate course. You know, when we do our free AWS courses or we do free AWS training, it's really important that we deliver what we feel is the best in the world. So we'll keep going until we've completed the material. So we'll probably go through Saturday and possibly Sunday as well. You both, I know you very well. Thank you so much. Um, Allison, thank you so much. 
10 seam. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Io, it's understandable. Yeah, I guess I don't read as much as I used to, but I used to love to, Io. I used to love to. Can you scale vertically, vertically with a scaling group? Um, not really sure what you mean. So if you want to scale vertically in terms of bigger servers, what you could do is you could set up your server to basically be like an x.1e32xlg, which is a 120 core server with four terabytes of RAM. You could use that as your primary and you could scale out by adding additional instances. So typically speaking, you scale up your server and then you scale out. Now I encourage you, if you had a choice to use two 64 core servers versus 128 core server, use two 64s. It goes back to the redundancy options. One is none, two is one, and three is greater than two. If you have one server, I promise you it'll fail. If you have two servers, I promise you you'll be less likely to fail. And if you got three servers, when one fails, who cares? So kind of my, my approach is the tactical approach to everything. More is better. Well, thank you all. See you back uh, tomorrow. It's been an honor, been a privilege. I hope you guys have had a lot of fun. If you've enjoyed this content, please share it with others. <clears throat> You know, one of these days I'm going to learn Hindi because I spent so much time. I've got so many students in India. My best friends live living in Bangalore, who's going to be joining my company very soon. So I spend so much time in that part of the world. I teach yoga um, and I can even practice Ayurvedic medicine. So it's a world that I definitely know. Would object storage work for applications like Netflix because the data is static? Exactly, Peer Lincoln. That's what Netflix uses. They store your videos in S3. They use CloudFront to get it to you much faster and by so you don't have to keep replicating content. And then they use DynamoDB to basically store that you're 20 minutes into the movie. Where did you say you, my, you find your checkbook recommendations? Here's where I get my checkbook recommendations. So I've been in the industry forever. Best technical publications that I know of come from Cisco Press. Here's the thing with Cisco Press. They tell you what is the tech, how does it work, why do organizations use it, how does it benefit an enterprise. Hey, that's architecture. Cisco Tech Press books are extremely good. Microsoft does a relatively good job explaining their things. Red Hat does an acceptable job explaining some of the things on Linux, not great. Oracle provides excellent documentation on databases. Docker and Kubernetes provide excellent documentation on containers. I get my information straight from the source. But Cisco Press books are amazing. Are there any others, Chris? So uh, you're kind of getting overshadowed here. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving this. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know. I'm glad everyone enjoyed. I'm glad everyone, you know, had a chance to hopefully, you know, go toe to toe and and do it in real time. But if not, please practice. Reference um, the labs in the uh, in the PDF, and you're going to do fine. So I'm looking forward to the next one with everyone. I think that sounds great, Peer Lincoln. You're saying 8 p.m. I think you said you were in Nigeria. That makes sense. Um, thank you for being here from Nigeria. Out of curiosity, could you all type the country you're coming from right now? Those of you that are left. That'd be awesome. We got, a Sydney, I love we got a Sydney person in here somewhere. I saw mm -hmm. it. I can't find it now. And I remember yesterday we had someone from Venezuela and all the way from Scotland. So we we got good coverage. Yeah. And we, we had, had we had Scotland by way of Nigeria. I think. Yeah, really that one was, yeah. that. was awesome. Yeah, yeah, so if you can let us know, Pierre. type in, uh, yeah, yeah. Sanchez says, Amod says, India, New Mag says, India, Lenny, Spain, love it. Asheville, North Carolina, fantastic place. Yara, head over heels, Greece, Yasas, Dio de Ana, Echo, Asena, Apato, Apostimiomu. So, Shapur, Cantriol, Fantastic, Finland, wonderful. Shaky Farms, UK. Leo, Brazil. Pier, Nigeria, Lam and Gambia, Kill in Cameroon, but live in the U.S. This is so great. Alice in PA, I used to live there. Sean in Oakland, California. Awesome. Um, Jesse's in San Francisco. Jawad's in Bulgaria, Scotland. Oh, yeah. This is awesome. Bulgaria and Scotland, very close to where I'm from, which is Greece. Jawad's in New Jersey. I lived there for years. Kenya, I love in this. Virginia, San Francisco, Houston, Sydney, Australia, there we go, Sydney, Nashville. Yeah. 
Santa Clara, Las Vegas. Although, Jeannie, I know where you're really from, Ethiopia. And Jeannie actually took my class. She had to go home and visit family in Ethiopia. And she managed to take my class in Ethiopia. Super proud of her. She does great. Um, Helsinki, Thanks, Finland. Wow, nice. This is what great. time is it in Sydney right now? Yeah. In India. Um, Eferisto. Um, head over heels. Uh, Phoenix is in Toronto. Um, Theo's in Silver Springs. I used to Nigeria, live in Syria, Cameroon. This is like the best feeling <laughs> ever. How okay, often I, do you get to speak with this many wonderful people yeah. from all over the world now? Denmark and Bulgaria. I mean, all these people working together to build each other's up and build their careers. There is I nothing. I had better. a list of everybody in Zambia. Wow, Mexico. Mexico. Sweet. So you know, this is just this is just why I'm always so excited to be on YouTube because we get this many people from this many places, and you know, this is after we actually finished the class. So like, this is like really wonderful. So. Um, so I, you can reach out to any of us on LinkedIn. Chris, you can put my LinkedIn profile um, up there because people are always looking for how to connect. And, you know, I'm pretty open to connecting. Um, Thomas, Percy, you can access part one. Absolutely. Um, yeah, Chris, I'm about to, I'm about to Chris and my team is going to pop the link for this. If any of you guys Actually, are willing. Uh, I'm going to paste the link to the playlist for the entire Put the link to the playlist, and if any of you guys are, remember we have a contest that ends this week. We're going to give away two slots to our Cloud Architect Career Development Program. Remember, the way to get to the contest is to win the contest is to write the most persuasive um, social media post. Copy us, just like we posted, on how on to take this course. We want to check your sales skills, your persuasion skills. We've had a good number of 10 so far, but we're going to announce two winners at the end of the week. Wow, 620 in Sydney. So thankful that you stayed up through the night. Um, I hope we made it real worth it for you. So Chris can post a link in the window to the, the, to the contest that I made to get a lot of people to promote this, let lots of people free training. And that's why we're going to give two free slots to our Cloud Architect Career Development Program. Peter Lincoln, you can make a new one. <laughs> improve and improvise <laughs> adapt improvise and overcome i've had several people make a half a dozen posts which shows all kinds of motivation my way so you know what go ahead go out there go do it i'm finding uh, i'm finding the uh, we're gonna we're, we're gonna give you that post to give you a chance to win okay here we go i got a reminder post i'll share the link okay Share that link, share how to connect with me or follow oh, okay. me. I can just, okay. I don't want to flood it. Give me a second. <laughs> All right, let's see if this works. So, see that person at the other end, my chief operating officer is the person that makes sure we do things that make sense because I will tell him, hey, guess what? Can we write 17 books by next week and give them away for free? <laughs> He'll say, Mike, um, you've got 17 books in action. You can't write 17 more by next Monday. But if it was me, I would do it. So, Chris, you posted a LinkedIn. I think you posted you know, how to enter the contest. Yeah. Now, Chris will post a how to connect with Mike link. For people that are interested in our training, please put a link to the course, a 20% coupon, and the phone number to our office, which I know we're not supposed to do, but we're going to do it anyway. Uh, I'll leave that phone number up to you. I, I, I will post yeah. it. <laughs> we know I, how I am with that phone number. <laughs> I don't make that many mistakes, but I messed that one up one time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. That's a fair point. Um, <laughs> so I am going to uh, do the following. We actually wrote a book on passing this exam. I'm going to give you guys the link to that so you can get that book as well. I will tell you, when you fill in the form, it takes 15 minutes for our servers to email you. So when someone sends me a form that says, I've just got it and I haven't got an email, when you share that, can you type out link to book? Link well? to Ta free AWS certified solutions architect associate. I, okay, so how do we do this? Now, tomorrow, I strongly recommend that anybody that can attend our completely free 
how to get your first cloud architect job webinar at nine. We will tell you what hiring managers desire. We will tell you the skills that you need to know, the things that need to be mastered to get hired, ways to skip HR and go straight to the hiring manager so you can get hired. And I will post that link. They're going to have all our links by the end of this. <laughs> well, this is good. We're sharing lots of links so you guys can be as successful as possible in your cloud architect career. And then we've showed uh, how you can connect to us on LinkedIn, um, which you know we probably have a fair, a fair number of people. That, well, a lot of people that already hit that, and that's great. I am always happy to accept connections with people until I can no longer accept them, which is coming soon. All right. Yasas head over hills. And um, any other questions for me? Pakistan. Pakistan. Oh, good. Yes. Another important country. I, I couldn't imagine we didn't have anybody. So you have access to all of our training for, for tomorrow. Um, um, love to have you attend our How to Get Your First Cloud Architect job tomorrow. And Anything we can do to help you in your cloud architect, solution architect, cloud computing career, we want to do what we can. So please feel free, come back, ask questions, tell others. Thank you all so much. Alonzo, bottom of my heart, thank you for sharing some of your experience, your expertise with the group. You know, a really solid cloud architect like you with the kind of experience you have and capabilities is a very rare find. So thank you for coming on and sharing your experience, your capabilities with uh, the community. Very much my pleasure, Mike. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much. Take care. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye.